そうだけどさ、なんかさ、え、じゃあ、その、ね、全然じゃあ、続いて、それは、あ、そう、そう、そうだったかな、なんかさ、問題があったかな、なんかさ、<笑>Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the city council chambers. I am council member Vanessa Gibson of the 16th District of the Bronx, and I'm proud to chair the Committee on Public Safety. First, let me thank each and every one of you for being here this afternoon.、Um, there are important legislation and resolutions on today's agenda that relate to accountability in the criminal justice system and strengthening gun safety. Before we begin today's hearing, I want to acknowledge that we will be voting on. Intro 1569, which I'm proud to serve as prime sponsor, which relates to the prohibiting of disorderly behavior. This legislation will create an administrative code offense that is an alternative to the state's current disorderly conduct statute and would carry a maximum penalty of no more than five days in jail. This bill would give more options to prosecutors in resolving many cases that could potentially avoid negative consequences for many New Yorkers. Creating this city offense alternative will not only help our growing immigrant community, but all New Yorkers that is truly in line with our city council's goal of creating proportional penalties for low level offenses. I'd like to acknowledge the members of the committee who were here Councilmember j a m a n i Williams, Councilmember Rafael Espinal, Councilmember Rory Lansman, Minority Leader Steve Matteo, Councilmember Vincent Gentili, Councilmember Robert Cornegie, and Councilmember Richie Torres. And before we begin, do any of my colleagues have questions on the legislation that we need to take a vote on, Intro 1569? Please do so now. Also, like to acknowledge the presence of Councilmember Corey Johnson. And with that, let me turn to our committee clerk to begin calling the roll. Thank you, colleagues. Committee Clerk Matthew DeStefano, Committee on Public Safety. Roll call vote on intro number 1569A. Chair Gibson. I vote aye. Gentili. Williams. Carnegie. Espinal. Lanceman. Aye. Torres. Matteo. No. By a vote of seven in the affirmative, one in the negative, and no abstentions, the item has been adopted. We also have been joined by Councilmember Jimmy Vaca, also a member of the committee. Councilmember Vaca. Thank you, colleagues, for your support of Intro 1569. We're going to keep the voting roll open as we begin our hearing today on public safety. 
Today's agenda includes three reporting bills today that generally relate to comprehensive reporting on criminal enforcement in the city of New York, jumping the turnstile arrests and NYPD crime clearance rates. In addition, there are bills relating to requiring the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to address the warrant system and create a system to address errors on people's criminal records. There is also a resolution in support of a state bill in relation to gravity knives. Finally, we are hearing two resolutions and one bill relating to gun safety. Recently, there have been several reports indicating the need for the NYPD to allocate more detective and investigators in boroughs that experience more crime. This determination could be assisted by the analysis of precinct crime clearance rates. Introduction number 1611, sponsored by Councilmember Torres, relates to requiring the police department to submit re reports on clearance rates. Introduction number 1636, sponsored by Councilmember Johnson, relates to requiring the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to arrest, address erroneous criminal records. According to the Legal Action Center, there are nearly 2.1 million criminal records that include bureaucratic errors. These errors could have serious collateral effects on an individual in specific areas of housing, employment, and other social service benefits. This bill will begin to address many of these issues. Introduction 1664 and 1712 are both sponsored by Councilmember Lansman. Intro 1664 relates to reporting on fair evasion arrests or jumping the turnstile offenses. The NYPD can enforce, enforce this by issuing a civil summons returnable to the Transit Adjudication Bureau or under the state's penal law. This bill will require the NYPD to report how many TAB summons are issued and how many people are arrested under the penal law. The information would be disaggregated by police precinct, subway, transit bureau, as well as demographics of the offender. We're also hearing two pre-considered bills, pre-considered bill number T-2017-6381, will address warrants in the city. Earlier this year, our speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, called for the clearance of summons warrants older than 10 years. In August, the district attorneys of Manhattan, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Queens dismissed over 600,000 warrants across the city. This pre-considered bill will further address issues with the current warrant system and require Mock J to make efforts to address outstanding criminal warrants and to issue an annual report related to these activities. We're also hearing two pre-considered resolutions and a pre-considered bill related to gun safety that I'm proud to co-sponsor along with our speaker. The most recent massacre in Las Vegas has sadly become an all too familiar narrative, yet our federal lawmakers refuse to take sensible action. We in the city of New York have one of the strongest gun laws in this country, and we must do everything possible to continue to pass resolutions and legislation. In addition, we must stand firm in opposing harmful federal legislation which threatens and undermines our priorities, which will also make New Yorkers less safe and undermine all the efforts that we fight for every day to protect our city. The next two pre-considered resolutions and bills are sponsored by the speaker and myself. Uh, the first one is T-2017-6704, which opposes the federal legislation known as the Hearing Protection Act of 2017. This deceivingly titled bill would eliminate the transfer tax on silencers and eliminate the months-long federal registration process. Many of the victims of the Las Vegas shooting were saved because they could hear the sound of gunfire. This loosening of restrictions on gun silencers would make all of us less safe, and I strongly oppose this legislation. The other pre-considered resolution is T-2017-6706, which calls upon Congress and the President to oppose the federal concealed to carry well, excuse me, Reciprocity Act of 2017. This committee heard earlier this year and passed a resolution on a similar bill last May under the former federal administration. 
We continue to oppose this dangerous piece of legislation. This bill would allow a resident from one state who has a license to carry a concealed handgun to lawfully carry their firearm to a different state, regardless of the licensing eligibility standards of the other state. New York City has one of the strictest licensing laws. Our licensing division at the NYPD conducts a rigorous screening of each applicant prior to granting a license. The city does not recognize out-of-city permits, including those issued by the state of New York. This federal bill would undermine our ability to keep our fellow New Yorkers safe. It will compromise our officers' ability to safely police our streets. Preconsidered intro number T2017-6705 relates to requiring the police department to disclose gun violence information to applicants for firearm licenses and permits. According to surveys, 63% of Americans believe that having a gun in their house makes them safer. However, several studies indicate quite the opposite. Homes with firearms have an increased risk of suicide, accidental shooting, and death during domestic incidents. This bill will require the NYPD to provide a warning to applicants for firearm licenses and permits relating to the increased risk of owning a firearm. Just like the warnings on the side of cigarette packs, change the perceptions that many have of smoking, these gun warnings are the first step to changing the public's conversation. We would be one of the first major jurisdictions to enact this type of legislation. We're also hearing a resolution which I am proud to sponsor, Resolution 1660, relating to gravity knives. While I am aware that there's current legislation before the governor's office that this resolution supports, we also know that various stakeholders are also a part of current conversations with all of the stakeholders, including the governor's office and the NYPD. I am interested in learning more about the issues of gravity knives in general that we're having in the city and would also like to publicly continue the conversation that we're having during today's hearing. I'd like to thank all of the sponsors of today's legislation and all of the staff that worked very hard on these important bills. We continue to strive to continue to hear and pass legislation here in this council that really strives to keep all New Yorkers safe. I'd like to recognize the Committee on Public Safety staff, our Senior Legislative Counsel, Deepa Ambakar, our Legislative Policy Analyst, Casey Addison, and our Financial Analyst, Steve Reister, and my Chief of Staff, Dana Wax. And with that, I believe we have opening remarks that I will get to from the prime sponsors of legislation that's on today's agenda. First, we will hear from Councilmember Rory Lansman, followed by Councilmember Corey Johnson. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my bill, intro 1664, would require the NYPD to increase, to release data quarterly on the number of arrests and Civil Transit Adjudication Bureau summonses issued for subway fare evasion, and to break down that data by age, gender, race, the subway station where enforcement occurred, and the precinct of the officer. We already know that in the first six months of 2017, the NYPD made more than 30,000 stops for jumping a turnstile and arrested 8,625 people for theft of services, a misdemeanor offense under state penal law. We know that almost 90% of those arrested for that misdemeanor were black or Latino. We know that the difference between an arrest for fair evasion, which can result in jail time, a criminal record, and can lead to deportation for even legal permanent residents, let alone visa holders or undocumented immigrants, and a civil violation for violating the MTA's rules, which is like a parking ticket, is an astronomical difference. What we don't know is how the NYPD is focusing its enforcement of this low-level nonviolent offense in which neighborhoods against which New Yorkers, which precincts are spending time and resources chasing down fare beaters. We can speculate from the bits of information the NYPD sporadically releases. We can also extrapol extrapolate from reports like the one issued by the Community Service Society recently, quote, the crime of being short 275 
policing communities of color at the turnstile, which was based on information collected by public defenders in Brooklyn, which found that neither poverty nor criminal complaints fully account for the racial disparity in arrests. In order to know the answer to all these questions, we must have full and complete data. And that is why I'm very pleased to have the Public Safety Committee consider my bill today, and I look forward to the testimony related to it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Lansman, and now we'll have Councilmember Corey Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for hearing this bill today. Uh, for too long, a criminal record has served as a modern-day scarlet letter. There are countless ways to impede a person's personal and professional growth. Due to the immense impact these records can have, it is critical that they be held to the highest standards of accuracy and to be maintained beyond reproach. To ensure that that is the case, my bill, Introduction uh, 1636, being discussed here today would establish a system to allow both members of the public and nonprofit organizations to rectify erroneous criminal records. These are the people who are both directly impacted by these incorrect records and those advocates fighting on their behalf every day. They deserve a voice and a mechanism to effect direct change to a flawed system. Furthermore, while correcting the existing inaccuracies within the criminal records is an immediate concern, we must also address the underlying issues that lead to them in the first place. A lack of communication and transparency between the state and local officials tasked with maintaining these records has continued for far too long. With the immense power these records wield over the lives of those whose histories they detail comes even greater responsibility to dedicate every available resource to identifying the root causes of errors within them and to propose permanent solutions to address them. Every day that an erroneous criminal record goes uncorrected, it negatively impacts someone's life. We have a responsibility to resolve these issues both swiftly and permanently. I'd like to thank the Public Safety Chair, Vanessa Gibson, my good friend, for hearing this bill today, and my fellow council members who have lent their support to it, and those whose lives have been affected by an erroneous criminal record. Thank you for sharing your story and demanding better, and I look forward to working with the administration to pass this piece of legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you to all of my colleagues um, who are here for today's hearing. I'd like to begin with our first panel assembled before us, our Chief of Detectives, Chief uh, Robert Boyce from the NYPD, Oleg Chervnoski, our Director of Legislative Affairs with the NYPD. We also have our Assistant Chief Vincent Coogan, the NYPD Transit Bureau. We have Nicole Torres, Deputy Chief of Public Affairs for the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, and General Counsel for the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Alex Crone. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Apologies for the late start. Um, and now, before you begin your testimony, we will just have our counsel administer the oath, and then you may begin. Thank you once again. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Great. Who begins? Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Gibson and members of the Committee on Public Safety. My name is Alex Crone, and I'm the General Counsel of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm joined by my colleague, Nicole Torres, Deputy Chief of Public Affairs at MACJ. The Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice advises the Mayor on public safety strategies and, together with partners both inside and outside of government, develops and implements policies aimed at reducing crime, reducing unnecessary arrests and incarceration, promoting fairness, and building strong and safe neighborhoods. The issues we are here to discuss today should be seen in New York City's larger context. In the last three years in New York City, we have seen an acceleration of the trends that have defined the public safety landscape in this city over the last three decades. While jail and prison population around the country increased, New York City's jail population has fallen by half since 1990. And in the last three years, the jail population dropped by an additional 18%, the largest three-year decline in the last 20 years. This declining use of jails has happened alongside record crime lows. Major crime has fallen by 76% in the last 30 years and by 9% in the last three years. 2016 was the safest year in CompStat history, with homicides down 5%, shootings down 12%, and burglaries down 15% from 2015. Arrests for low-level crimes continue to fall. Misdemeanor arrests are down 24% in the last five years. Violation arrests down 13% since 2013. And the number of jail admissions for misdemeanor detainees has dropped by 25% since 2014, suggesting we are getting closer to the goal of reserving jail for the, only those who pose a public safety risk. 
New York City's experience is continued and unique proof that we can have both more safety and smaller jails. To drive down crime, arrests, and the unnecessary use of jail even further, our office seeks to enhance the spectrum of criminal justice responses available to effectively match criminal justice responses to risk and need. The bills we are discussing today touch on many of the existing efforts the city is undertaking. In 2014, approximately 310,000 summonses were handled by the criminal court system. Only 27% of these summonses resulted in a conviction. The pressing problem with the current summons process is the 38% warrant rate for failure to appear in court. This high warrant rate is troubling. It signals that something is not working if people do not even show up for court, and it has consequences, both consequences for the individuals issued warrants and for the criminal justice system's use of resources. It can mean a police encounter for a low-level offense escalating to an arrest, leaving an individual with a dampened perspective on the fairness and effectiveness of the criminal justice system. To address this problem, in partnership with the state court system, the city is already implementing various changes to the summons process to ensure that when criminal summonses are used, individuals easily understand when and where they need to appear in court. We have also completed a successful pilot of a text message reminder system that will decrease the warrant rate for failure to appear in summons court. The Criminal Justice Act, passed by the council last year and signed into law by the mayor, went into effect on June 13, 2017, as an important improvement to the enforcement and adjudication of low-level offenses. By creating the option for officers to issue a civil ticket in response to low-level offenses such as littering, appropriate low-level cases are by bypassing the criminal justice system altogether, avoiding the possibility of a warrant for failure to appear. Finally, this summer, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens District Attorney's offices moved to dismiss over 600,000 open summons warrants. The staggering backlog of open warrants were vacated, allowing thousands of New Yorkers to live their lives without fear of arrest stemming from low-level warrants issued more than a decade ago. The city supports the goal of continuing to work with the courts, prosecutors, and police department to create a lighter touch on low-level enforcement and reduce any collateral consequences associated with such low-level offenses. While we have concerns about the availability of some of the data that we would be required to report under, under this legislation, we nonetheless look forward to our continued partnership on legislative reforms to enhance, advance this goal. Ensuring that individuals do not face unnecessary barriers to leading a stable life is a key element of ensuring that they do not face further involvement with the criminal justice system. As such, the administration is in favor of directing New Yorkers to resources that help lift these barriers, such as mechanisms to correct rap sheet errors. However, our office has concerns about any legislation that will require us to establish a system to correct errors that is contingent on state participation. As such, we look forward to discussing with the Council how best to accomplish the goals of this legislation. Finally, Intro 1712 requires our office to report on the dispositions of criminal enforcement activity. Currently, the state's records of dispositions do not link back to enforcement data. Therefore, it is impossible to trace which enforcement agency issued the original arrest that led to a particular disposition. Moreover, disposition data is not under the control of the city. Given these concerns, we cannot support this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. I'd be happy to any, answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Crone. And before you begin, we're just going to go back to our quick vote. Thank you. Continuation of roll call on intro 1569A, Council Member Baca. Aye. The vote for approval now stands at eight in the affirmative, one in the negative, and no abstentions. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you very much. And we are closing the vote for intro 1568 on the agenda. Thank you very much, and I will continue with the hearing. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Gibson and members of the Council. I am Oleg Chernovsky, the Director of Legislative Affairs for the New York City Police Department. I'm joined here today by several of my NYPD colleagues, Chief of Detectives Robert Boyce, Assistant Chief Vincent Coogan from the Transit Bureau, and Jonathan David, Director of our License Division, as well as my colleagues from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. On behalf of Police Commissioner James P. O'Neill, I wish to thank the City Council for the opportunity to comment on several of the bills under consideration today. Under this administration and with the help of our partners in government, including the City Council, the NYPD has continued to keep New York City the safest big city in the world. Working closely with the community and making key changes in our operations over the last four years is bearing fruit in terms of both crime fighting and community connection. The city is seeing dramatic declines in crime, the lowest levels of murder since the late 1950s, the lowest level of shootings on record, capped off with the safest, safest September in the modern era. While these reductions are historic, what is more meaningful is the manner in which the department is doing it. The department has scaled back on arrests and summonses, which have decreased significantly under this administration. 
NYPD officers are exercising far more discretion in the use of their enforcement powers and are working closely with communities, policing with them rather than at them. Neighborhood policing is at the heart of the department's agenda. It is allowing the department to count the residents of our local precincts among our strongest partners, fostering trust and making our city safer on every block. Several of the bills under consideration today are of interest to the department. I would like to provide my comments on the following bills. Pre-considered intro T-2017-6705 would require that the NYPD License Division provide applicants for firearm licenses and permits with a, with a warning pertaining to the increased risk of suicide, unintentional death, and death during a domestic dispute in households with firearms. The NYPD License Division is responsible for the application process, screening, and issuing of various types of handgun licenses, as well as rifle and shotgun permits. Although it is unclear from the bill whether the information in the warning is generated from NYPD statistics or another reputable organization, the department is supportive of the legislation. Intro 1611 would require the NYPD to report quarterly on the clearance rate of index crimes disaggregated by the precinct or other patrol unit. While the department conceptually supports the legislation, we recommend that the definition of clearance rate be amended to remove references to individuals charged with the commission of an offense and crimes being turned over to the court for prosecution. As you may know, there are many reasons for why a valid arrest made with probable cause may not ultimately be prosecuted. This could include the withdrawal of cooperation by a material witness, a court's determination that it lacks geographical or legal jurisdiction, or a variety of other reasons. Ultimately, as arrest data is in the department's control, unlike da data relative to charging and prosecution, amending the definition is critical to the department's ability to comply with this bill. We look forward to working with the council on this legislation. Intro 1664 would require the NYPD to report on the number of arrests for theft of services under the penal law and the number of summonses issued that are returnable to the Metropolitan Transit Authority's Transit Adjudi Adjudication Bureau for subway fare evasion. NYPD Transit Bureau personnel deploy in both uniform and plain clothes to enforce theft of services in the subway system. Officers patrol their assigned posts during a tour of duty. These patrols include surveys of subway cars, station platforms, station entrances and exits, as well as station mezzanines where most subway turnstiles are located. Officers are trained to spot a myriad of fare evasion techniques, which include jumping over turnstiles, crawling under turnstiles, manipulating turnstiles, entering via the exit only gate, etc. Those observed committing theft of services are subject to a TAB summons, Transit, Transit Adjudication Bureau summons, which is a civil summons, or arrest under the penal law. Similar to the recent implemented Criminal Justice Reform Act in determining whether to make civil or criminal enforcement, the department determines if the individual is a recidivist. A transit recidivist is generally an individual that meets any of the following criteria has a prior felony or misdemeanor arrest in the transit system in the past two years, any prior sex crime arrest in the transit system, three or more violation level arrests in the transit system in the past five years, three or more tab summonses in the past two years, or is on probation or parole. Overwhelmingly, a tab summons is issued to a person who commits theft of services in the subway system rather than making an arrest. Citywide in 2016, nearly 75% or three quarters of the individuals who committed theft of services in the subway were issued a TAB summons, a civil summons. Year to date, the percentage is relatively the same. The department demonstrates significant discretion when enforcing theft of services, and this practice is consistent with this administration's concerted efforts to divert people away from the criminal justice system where the circumstances are appropriate. With respect to intro 1664, the department is committed to transparency and providing more information to the public about enforcement that takes place in the city's transit system. The department has some initial concerns about the bill as some of the information it seeks is not consistent 
with how the department maintains its data. Spe specifically, in arrest situations, the department does not track the specific criteria within the transit recidivist definition for why a tab summons is not issued. Officers in the field are only informed as to whether the individual that they have temporarily detained for fare evasion is either a transit recidivist or not. Notwithstanding this challenge, the department is capable of reporting the remaining data sought and looks forward to working with the council on this legislation. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss these bills today. My colleagues and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your testimony today and your presence, a very important agenda before us today. Um, and while I know the department's general rule is to not specifically comment on resolutions, I really appreciate the department's strong opposition joining us in terms of the federal legislation that uh, sits before us in the House and the Senate as it relates to the Conceal to Carry as well as the Silencer Bill. So we really appreciate that. And certainly beyond today's hearing, more to come. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, if there is any advocacy, um, the police commissioner has gone to D.C. before in his efforts to testify before members to really voice the, the city's opposition. So I really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to begin with the intro 1617, which is sponsored by Councilmember Torres, that relates to the clearance rates for the seven index crimes by precinct or patrol unit. And Chief, I wanted to ask the question, um, obviously there was uh, an article in the New York Times that talked about the 4-0 precinct in the South Bronx um, being uh, one of the highest in terms of the, the murder rate in the Bronx, um, but having potentially the fewest detectives per violent crime. So I wanted to first, for the record, talk about what has happened since that time in terms of deploying more investigators for the detective squad in the 4-0, and also just in general what the Detective Bureau has done. And then I also wanted to ask specifically about how we monitor clearance rates. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Everybody. Good afternoon. So, so uh, we, at the, um, well, the New York Times article went out, we did a thorough look throughout the Detective Bureau and see what was happening, what squads were short on detectives, and, and we did a caseload study. Uh, all our caseloads is we look at on a busy squad like that, we don't want any more than 150 cases per year for investigator. Uh, the slower the slower um, commands without much less violence, about 170. Uh, so that's the, that's the uh, critical uh, data we looked at. We were able to get 75 uh, new white shields into the Bronx right after that report came out. Um, quite a few of them, I, I believe 11 went to the 4-0 precinct. So that was the largest uh, transfer of detectives that I've had in my tenure as chief of detectives. But across the city, we were able to get more and more uh, new investigators into squads, not as many as the Bronx, but we got quite a few in to just lessen the load. And it's paid a dividend, uh, quite a large dividend, because positive closing rates have gone up considerably um, in the last four years. Well, in the last six years, it's gone up considerably. We attribute that to more detectives, more training, um, and, and a host of other innovations as well as technology to get that done. So uh, if you look at the positive closing rates right now, which is either arrests by detective bureaus, which is about 88 percent of, of how we close cases. Now, we, we, we'll do uh, 250,000, a quarter million cases a year. That's what we catch normally in and around that, that, uh, those numbers right there. Uh, seven majors are much less than that, but are important to us because that's major crimes as defined by the FBI. So what we're looking at now is 88 percent of those cases, 88 percent are closed with arrests. I'm sorry, 88 percent of the arrests are done by Detective Bureau. About 24 percent okay. year to date are closed out of those cases. And that's 74,000. Uh, we've closed up uh, 1,800, 18,000 with arrests. It's about 24 percent. That number has grown over the years. Um, if you go back to 2011, it was 17 percent then 16, then 18 in 2013, 22 percent in 2014, 22 percent again in 2015, 23 and now 24. So we're gradually going up in our closing rates, positive closing rates. Uh, so that's where we are with the Detective Bureau right now. Okay. So the clearance rate is essentially the closure rate in terms of the, the case being closed as in conviction or meaning the detective work is complete? They, it's closed with an arrest. 
for that Close crime. within arrest. Close okay. within arrest for that crime. And I, I think Oligan said before that we then take the case to the district attorney's office. What happens in cases where you have multiple defendants? Um, does that apply in terms of if it's five subjects, all five have to be arrested for that case to close? No. One, one case has to be closed. That's how we clear a case. One case. We often arrest many people on the case, but it counts as one clearance. That's all. No matter how many people you arrest, it counts as one clearance on that okay. particular case of robbery or something. Okay. So the 88% you described, that's this New York City number. 88% is six out of um, 18,000 arrests, five, 18,506 arrests we've made mm -hmm. so far on the seven majors. Right. Here, seven major crimes. 16,444 were done by the Detective Bureau with a okay. positive closing. 1,819 were done by patrol. So we had a case and patrol actually made the arrest, which happens. Um, and then 243 were closed by exceptional circumstance, a very small number. Generally speaking, it is that when the perpetrator dies uh, in, in, any, in any form or is in jail, we can't arrest him for that. So th that's 243, a very small number. Okay. So when you ask the question, which precinct currently has the highest clearance rate okay. or which precinct has the lowest clearance rate, um, I want you to speak a little bit about, I guess, the public perception sometimes is there really isn't a lot of information, obviously, that's available to the public in terms of all of the work detectives do to close a case, meaning make an arrest. Um, a lot of it is contingent upon evidence, you know, footage from security cameras, the cooperation of witnesses. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen. And I guess many of us in the council sometimes deal with this from experiences in our own districts where we we have a shooting or a homicide and we're dealing with the impacted family and sometimes there is cooperation but sometimes there isn't and so a lot of that is really left to the ability of the detectives and their skill set to make sure that they can close the case so when we say that one borough versus another has the highest clearance rate does that mean that they're doing the best job, or does that mean that we have to look at the detective squad overall to see where we need to increase resources? And like you talked about training and making sure the detectives have the most information they can and the most tools at their disposal. So the precinct with the highest clearance rate versus the one with the lowest clearance rate and that spectrum. Okay, I have them broken down by boroughs, and there's not a lot of swing in between each borough, but I'll, okay. I'll go through each one. Okay. Uh, starting with Manhattan South, <clears throat> they caught 15,810 cases, they made 3,469 arrests, which is a 22% positive clearance rate. Uh, that's Manhattan South. Manhattan North, they caught 8,000, these are only index crimes, by the way. Right. 8,673, okay. they made 1,663 arrests, they had a 19% closing rate. Okay. We get to the Bronx, 13,734 cases of index crimes, they made 3,743 um, arrests for those crimes is a 27% closing rate, the highest in the city. Um, okay. We have Brooklyn South with 9,787, uh, 9, 2,235 arrests, which is 23%. Brooklyn North, uh, the second highest closing rate in the city, 10,280, 2,449 for, for, 40, for a 24% closing rate. Okay. Um, going into Queens, 6,000. We're at Queens North or Queens South? Queens North, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Queens South, 6,245 cases, 1,776 positive clearance rates, 28%. Um, okay. Queens, Queens North, 7,912, 1,954 positive clearance rates, 25%. And we finish with Staten Island, 74,435. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I gave you the total. 1,994, 704 ca uh, four cases for a 24 uh, percent. Totalized citywide is 24 percent as well. So okay. that's where we come up with these numbers, and this is for major crimes. Okay. So the legislation before the committee that talks about putting all of this into an actual report, um, the position of the administration and your ability to comply with reporting on the clearance rates for the seven major index crimes. Is so, that something? Yeah, right. So conceptually, we're, we're supportive. Um, we, we think we can report uh, with the exception of the definition of clearance rate would okay. need to be amended because it takes, 
It factors in data not within the department's control. When we limit it to arrest data, that is data within the department's control, and we can report based on whether or not an arrest has been made in conjunction with a complaint for an index crime. That and then um, also the disaggregation by, I believe it has it as uh, precinct, PSA, transit district, mm -hmm. street crime unit, and narcotics division. But for example, street crime unit, it's not a unit any longer within okay. the department. So we'll have to figure out, working with the chief of detectives and working with the council, we'll have to figure out the parameters of how to break down okay. uh, the statistics. But just as the chief just mentioned, certainly patrol borough is something uh, that could be done. Okay. And chief, the numbers that you're giving me on the clearance rates, that does include PSAs as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to make sure. That, I knew it did, but I just want to double check. Detective bureaus, uh, detective squads catch those uh, in whatever the jurisdictional, whatever ju uh, jurisdiction they're in. So yes, right. It does. So for instance, if it's a PSA seven in the four two, it would be four two detective squad that would That's handle correct. that case. Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Just making sure. Okay. Um, I want to move on to. Intro 1664, Council Member Lansman uh, is a prime sponsor and we'll probably talk more about that. But I just wanted to ask specifically about um, officers being stationed in every train station to issue uh, tab summons or theft of services arrest. How is it determined where transit officers are stationed in terms of foot patrol on the platform and the entrance exits? How does that work within the Transit Bureau? I mean, we assign officers on a, a different parts, but crime, you know, where we, our crime is occurring, that is one of the, you know, places, one of the reasons why we assign officers to certain stations. There could be certain conditions at stations, such as swipers, uh, complaints from the public. Again, they could be swipers that the public is complaining about, or the MTA. Our ridership, you know, where we have a large amount of people, you know, we'll usually assign like the major hub stations, officers to those stations. And then we also take the, you know, the possibility of terrorism into uh, account. The major hubs such as Grand Central, Times Square, Herald Square, when assigning officers. Okay. Um, the legislation proposed by the council member um, includes uh, disaggregation by the particular station. Uh, the location, the precinct of the arresting officer, and obviously uh, age, ethnic, demographic background, gender. And I wanted to know your thoughts on that. And obviously the reason why is because there is a lot of conversation about New Yorkers being arrested for fair evasion. And obviously some of the targeted enforcement that seems to happen in communities of color versus other communities. And I wanted to get your thoughts and understanding of this particular legislation itself and what offices are doing citywide, right? I represent Transit District 11 near Yankee Stadium that covers the entire four line, right? And so there are times when things happen and we have to call them, but obviously we, we've received some inquiries from some New Yorkers that feel like officers are stationed at certain train stations because there's a high concentration of young men and women of color where the enforcement is greater than it is in other places. So I wanted you to talk specifically about that because the legislation itself is asking for demographic data where we can understand how this is happening in terms of arrests, and also for us looking at trends and patterns. So I wanted to know if you could speak to that. Sure. So, I, I mean, I, I, it should go without saying, but I should start off by saying any claims that we right. deploy resources based on the percentage of, of individuals of color in a particular area is just purely false. Uh, as the chief just mentioned, there's a number of factors that goes into determining how we deploy. For example, potential for terroristic threat in stations like Times Square, Herald Square, uh, Grand Central, also complaints from the community, uh, the volume of ridership in a particular, in a particular transit station, uh, as well as criminal activity that relates back to that station. With respect to, with respect to the legislation, uh, I think for the most part, we would be able to comply with the data points that are sought in the legislation. So 
for example, the demographic, the age, the gender, the race, uh, mm -hmm. the station where the enforcement is happening. Uh, these data points uh, we can certainly comply with. Uh, the precinct of an officer, I think, I think what's, what, what is meant is uh, transit district because that's really who, who engages in this level of enforcement underground. As you know, the, the city transit system is divided up into transit districts, which mm -hmm. are essentially precincts underground. Mm -hmm. So that disaggregation point could be done based on transit district. I think where, where the bill calls for a particular type of disaggregation, which is uh, disaggregating which criteria within the definition of transit recidivist and, the de and disaggregating based on the criteria within that definition, that's something that we're not capable of doing as we stand. So the, I'll explain how the process works. If an, if an officer stops an individual for uh, theft of service, uh, the individual is run for a warrant check and whether or not the individual is a transit recidivist. And as I mentioned in the testimony, there are a number of factors that contribute to the definition of transit recidivist, among which are committing two felonies or, or misdemeanors in the transit system within two years, committing a sex crime, unlawful surveillance, which is looking up uh, people's uh, dresses when they're walking up the steps and positioning yourself under the steps to, to take pictures that would be unlawful surveillance, public lewdness, um, receiving multiple civil summonses, I believe it's three over the course of five years? Um, two. Three over the course of two okay. years. Uh, and there are other factors as well. Uh, what happens is when an officer calls in the name of an individual they stop, all they receive back is whether or not the person is a transit recidivist. It's either a yes or a no. Which factors contributed to that determination or sometimes an individual fits multiple criteria, that is not disaggregated. So I think the possible solution to that would be for us to simply make our transit recidivist policy public and we can post that on our, on our webpage so the public is aware of the factors that we consider in making an individual ineligible for a civil summons. Uh, but other than that, the various data points that the bill is looking for, we can comply with. Okay, what's the time frame on that measure going public? Uh, I believe just to, um, I mean, we have to get the uh, systems, they're generally in place, but we just want to streamline. I would think something to the tune of 90 days we can. Okay, how many transit districts do we have in New York City? 12. 12? Okay. Um, do you have reports that indicate the transit district that has the highest and lowest number of theft of service arrests? So do you have like a basic breakdown that tells you each transit bureau the number of arrests um, that you can look at potential trends to see where most of the theft of, theft of service arrests are happening throughout the city? Yes, we can give you by station or post within the station. Uh, you know, the amount of arrests or, or tab summonses that are given out. Okay. So if I ask the question today, based on your understanding, which transit bureau today has the highest number of arrests for theft of services? Uh, 42nd Street and 8th Avenue. That's transit district. Which one? Uh, that's transit district. Uh, that's TD1? One. 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 Transit okay. district 1. And what about the lowest? Uh, I don't have. To, I, I have the top ten with me. Oh, you have the top ten. Okay. Can you give us the list? Okay. Forty uh, Second Street and Eighth Avenue is number one. Fourteenth Street and Union Square, two. J Street, Metro Tech. Thirty Fourth Street and Herald Square, Stillwell Avenue and Coney Island, Utica Avenue and Crown Heights, One Hundred and Sixteenth Street and Lexington, Forty Second and Times Square. 3rd Avenue, 149th Street, and 125th and St. Nicholas. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's good to have this. Okay. I wanted to ask a question about the preconsidered resolution that 
pre-considered intro that talks about providing applicants for firearm licenses and permits with a warning system. So I wanted to understand the licensing division, right, which goes through an extremely um, long and lengthy process to even issue um, permits for firearms in New York City. So today, what information does the NYPD provide to any person when issued a firearm license today? Can I get an understanding? In oh, you have to come to the front. Yeah. And I need your name for the record. Oh, can we bring another? Can we bring another? Okay, uh, my name is Jonathan David. I'm the director of the NYPD License Division. Okay, could you repeat your name again? Jonathan David. Okay, sorry, I'm having trouble hearing today. There's a loud bill signing going on downstairs. <laughs> so um, when a person applies for a, uh, a gun license, um, you know, they, they have to fill out an application and they're interviewed by an investigator. Uh, the application is reviewed. We do a, a, an extensive background check. Um, we also have a pamphlet that we uh, hand out uh, to all uh, applicants about the uh, licensing division, about the laws and rules related to uh, gun licensing. And we also advise them of the different sections of law that they are supposed to familiarize themselves with uh, before they are before they obtain a gun license. And they have to sign a statement saying that they have familiarized themselves with various sections of law, yes, including, yes. So they have to sign a form that acknowledges that they've understood the pamphlets and all of the information that's been given, as well as the current local, state, and federal laws that they have to comply with? Not the pamphlet, but the local, state, and federal law, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, is there any way that we at the council can see one of the pamphlets and what it looks like? Um, yes, yes I, okay. I, I may have one with me, but if not, I can get one to you uh, very quickly. Okay, okay. And the reason being is because we just want to understand, I mean, this is a, a very intense process, and we obviously want to do as much as we can to make sure that anyone that is possessing a firearm and receiving a license um, from the department understands some of the uh, consequences, right, uh, as being a, a permit holder that could happen with unintentional deaths and suicides and domestic incidents. Um, so do you also provide any information on best practices or guidelines on safe storage as well of their gun? Uh, we, don't, I, we don't have detailed uh, guidelines about that. We do, have, we do state the, uh, the law that they're required to safeguard their gun in a uh, particular manner they, if they have uh, more than a certain number of guns. I think four, they have to have a safe. Um, if, they're, if, if they are not in the immediate presence of their gun, they, their gun has to be unloaded and uh, trigger, uh, trigger locked. Uh, but, uh, and those requirements are, those are stated in the pamphlet, but um, what, what, and there's actually a penal law provision that criminalizes the failure to uh, safeguard your uh, gun in a proper way, and that's in the rules that, that, we, that we're required to be familiar with. And that's the acknowledgement that they ultimately sign. Okay. Acknowledges that they read the relevant provision. Okay, but nothing's included in the pamphlet you, you're talking about. Well, they're just told that they have to safeguard their, their weapon, but they're not told speci in specifically like how to go about doing that. They're told that they're required to safeguard uh, their weapon. If it's not in their immediate control, it has to be uh, un unloaded and it has to be um, trigger locked. Or, or okay. Um, I recall when I served in the assembly, there was a number of bills related to safe storage of guns that were circulating in the assembly. I'm not sure where they've gone, um, but the current statute that you're talking about, is that a state statute or a federal statute of failure to safely store your, your gun? I believe it's in the, in the, in the penal law. Okay, it's actually state. a penal law crime not to, but I believe it's also restated. It's stated in different, at different levels of the law. It's stated... I believe again in, in the administrative in the administrative code, okay. and it's also I, I believe made reference to again in the rules. It's stated over and over again at local and state level. How many people apply for gun licenses annually to the department? Um, okay, just a moment. We have a number. I, I can tell you for starters, we have number of licensees. I can tell you off the top of my head, forty approximately forty thousand handgun licensees and twenty thousand or so. Uh, rifle and shotgun licensees. Uh, if you give me a minute, I can give you the number to date. That's annual? 
That's the total that we total active licensees. That's not. Oh, okay. That's, an, that's not the answer to your question, but that's okay. the number I had off the top of my head. Sorry. To answer your question specifically, that thanks. Like, the total number of handgun license applications to date uh, for 2017, 1,865. Uh, uh, last year for 2016, we had th a 3,147 handgun license applications. Wow. Okay. And we had this year, we have uh, denied uh, to date 500, disapproved 528 of the 1,865 applications. No, not, I'm sorry. We've dis this year to date, we've disapproved 528 uh, handgun applications. Applications, not necessarily applications that were made this year, but 528 handgun applications have been denied for calendar year 2017. Okay, and what's the most common reason why uh, a license is disapproved? Does it vary across the spectrum, or is there a particular? Well, we don't really. Uh, I don't have here today with me statistics um, about that, so I can't tell you based on statistics, and I'm not sure that our computer system can tell you that exactly, but. Um, uh, some of the common grounds are, are that uh, a person has been uh, arrested, a person has some sort of an arrest history. Um, we look at the arrest uh, and we look at the when, when, how long ago it occurred, what it was for. It's not an automatic bar, but it's, uh, it's, it's discretionary unless it was a felony conviction or certain misdemeanors. Also, domestic violence is looked at, the domestic mm -hmm. violence history. Um, those are two major ones, the arrests and domestic violence. Uh, we look at the, basically, we have a record of all of the, depart the person's involvement, interactions with NYPD in the uh, New York City, uh, whatever it may be, arrest, summons, domestic violence. And then we also ask them to provide a DMV abstract. We also look at, the, we also have a mental health history check um, that we do. Uh, so those are some of the major things that we look at. Okay, and then if they, keep, have, an, if they have an open order of protection, right. that's also very important. Okay. Well, I guess my two final questions on this topic. It's very, very interesting. Do you find that in your practice and in the division um, that licenses and grants these permits, that after we have one of these just unbelievable? mass shootings that we have across the country. It's typically said sometimes that the applicants for gun licenses does increase across the country. Do you notice that in New York City? Is that something where um, you're seeing more people applying for gun licenses after the effects of a mass shooting? Um, I have to say that I really don't know the answer to that question. Okay. I'd have it's to something I think about. Maybe yeah. I'm the only one who thinks about but that. But certainly, it's certainly something that I've noticed just is a major issue in people's minds, uh, always this mass shooting and mm -hmm. that occurred certainly made people, drawn people's attention to gun licensing in general. Mm -hmm. And and also uh, certainly that, that the tragedy that occurred has caused us to review our rules and think about ensuring that we have the best rules that we can for regulating gun licensing. So the, the legislation before us, um, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of support in making sure that we continue to further our education and promotion to those that are granted a, a firearm license to be aware of the unintended consequences, the risks that are involved. So is that something that the department uh, is willing to consider, the legislation before us, that really talks about an added level of education, in addition to the pamphlet you described, um, but specifically this one that talks about, you know, accidental shooting, suicide, domestic incidents, et cetera. Is that something that you think would be useful and helpful in your work? We do, and we're supportive of the legislation. All right, great. I like to hear that. Okay, great. Um, let me check. Colleagues, are you ready? Councilmember Lanceman? Yes. Councilmember Johnson, you guys ready for your questions? Yes. Okay, I'm just going to take a quick break. So I'm going to go to Councilmember Lanceman, followed by Councilmember Johnson. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. So my bill, 1664, which would require the PD to report on um, a fair beating stops. I understand from your testimony that uh, you 
seem okay with it, except one particular aspect of it having to do with how you collect um, data. As I understand, and just to be, to be clear, among, among other things that the bill would require the NYPD to report, um, the total number of arrests and the total number of summonses and the race, sex, and age of the arrestee, um, is in those circumstances where someone got a, a, a TAB summons, a Transit Adjudication Bureau summons uh, for the MTA, as opposed to an arrest, the bill would require the reason the uh, arrestee was uh, not issued a summons, someone who, who was charged with uh, theft of services under the penal law. Um, and I understand your opposition or your, your concern to be you don't collect data that way. J just to clarify, if, if I'm not mistaken, there, there is in the patrol guide um, a, a and, and, it, and if it's not in the patrol guide and it's somewhere else, please correct me, um, uh, a set of criteria that is supposed to be applied by the officer making the stop. And if the boxes are checked a certain way, you go into the criminal justice system and you're charged with a misdemeanor. And if the boxes are checked a different way, you go, is, is, it, is, it, is it that straightforward? And is it, is no. it in the patrol guide? No, no, it's, so, it's a little bit of a nuance. So go ahead. What happens is it, the officer in the field does not have that checkbox. You're correct in saying that there are these criteria, which are, and I mentioned, two felony or two misdemeanor arrests in the prior two years, or a sex crime in the transit system, or um, uh, uh, I think multiple violations. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. But what, general, what happens is that, that the officer making the stop for fare evasion would simply run the individual, much like a warrant check to see if the individual has a warrant. All the officer gets back is transit recidivist or not transit recidivist. If it's not transit recidivist, then they get a civil summons. If it is transit recidivist, they're, they're ineligible for a civil summons. They get arrested, but even of those that get arrested, many of them get a desk appearance ticket, so they get released from the, from the station house. But to your point, it's that disaggregation of which one of those factors within the transit recidivist definition resulted in the so individual a transit, not a transit recidivist is not <clears throat> literally someone who has repeated, is not merely limited to Correct. someone who has repeatedly. Correct. If they meet these other requirements, That's even if they've never jumped a turnstile before in their yes. life, but those people are still, the term is used, yes. a transit recidivist. Correct. And. And who's making that determination? Like the officer's calling in the person's info back to somewhere, and then that person is going through this checklist, and then that person is reporting to the officer, recidivist, not recidivist? Well, it's, I mean, it's computerized, much like a warrant check. The, the name is run, and, and it's, a, it's a merging of a variety of databases from the state, from, from internal arrest databases that contribute, and the answer is whether or not this individual was a prior, you know, was a... So the, so the things that would trigger mm -hmm. someone being a uh, recidivist and someone being uh, ineligible for a civil summons are, it's, it's purely a mathematical, computational formulation. You enter the person's name in the computer and outspits whether or not the person meets the criteria or doesn't meet the criteria. There's no one anywhere exercising any judgment or, or even doing any you know, manual checking of the person's record. No, I mean, there's not a manual checking. Of course, you know, ultimately, officers have have discretion in, in no, the I get situation. It, like you can... So the unique situations, but let's not make the exception the rule. Right. By and large, and to that point, I say 75% of the individuals that we come in contact with for theft of service receive the civil summons. So I understand. Right. So when so when the officer when when the officer puts the person's name into the computer and outspits uh, transit recidivist. Is any explanation given to the person who stopped? Like, this guy's getting a civil summons, but you're getting arrested because, because you had whatever, two felonies or whatever the criteria is. I mean, when if the person gets arrested, yes, they're given an explanation that they're a transit recidivist, they fall under this policy, but are, they, but are they told why they're a recidivist? Because there are different 
reasons that you could be a transit recidivist. I mean, an officer can look back and he could pretty much possibly see why he would be a transit recidivist if he falls into one of these five different categories, which I can give you if you want. Right. No, no, no. I mean, ultimately, so, council member, I, I think what you're trying to get at is, you know, an officer can manually run, I guess, your arrest record or run these various points when dealing with, I think, the issue, I think what the chief is saying and I, what you're saying is we will tell an individual that you're ineligible because you're a transit recidivist. We can say these are the things that make a transit recidivist. And I would imagine the individual would know if they were arrested on two felonies or if they've received three civil summonses over the last two years or, or where exactly they fall in. I mean, these are things that are right. known to the individual. So, right. So what we're getting to, though, for the purpose of this bill, mm -hmm. Right? Not all our other agreements or disagreements on how the police police this particular activity. But for the purpose of this bill, how difficult would it be to collect the data and, and record the data and note the data for the people who are getting arrested and are being charged with theft of services, why it is they qualified as a uh, transit recidivist, because that's what that's the that's the part of the bill sure. that your concern is. The reason the arrestee was not issued a summons returnable to the Transit Adjudication Bureau, presumably the reason is they're a transit recidivist, and we'd really want to know why are they a transit recidivist. Like it's in the system. Well, I, I think I, again, I'm I'm not a technology expert. Usually, when these sort of bills pass, then you know we've all worked on them and had some experience, to whether it was with summons reform or, or any of the other reporting bills, when the IT people get involved, they can certainly explain it better. But, you know, based on my basic understanding, it would be the same issue that we've had with all of these other bills. It would be the merge, the necessity to merge databases, some of which are not under our control. And, you know, for example, I'll give you one example with summons, with the CJRA, it was a matter, what took upwards of a year to do was merging with oath and having access to see what is or isn't a recidivist in, in their system, meaning an individual that keeps getting civil summonses, right, to work into the criteria. I mean, this would require merging of MTA databases and, and getting that type well, I don't, of... Feedback. I'm not an IT person either. I don't, I don't think that that's the case, though, because the information is, is there. It's, it's what's being... It's, it has to be there because it's it's spitting out a result for this person, you right? Know, it's Lanceman there. arrest. It's there, but it's creating a system where, on a case by case, person by person basis, that information is then collected, right? And stored and married to that person. And, yes, and that's that's always the issue, and that's always the the, the hard part. If the system doesn't already exist. It's a costly and time-consuming system to build. It may be. Yes. It may not be. Well. You're not an IT person. Well, but. You've confessed to not being an yes, IT person. Yes. I've confessed, confessed too. Yes. We're both guilty of not being IT people. Yes. All right. I'd like to continue this conversation, and not the usual manner where I send you a letter and I get one back six months later, but like a good one where we can sit and talk about it sure. with someone who actually is an IT person. Absolutely. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Councilmember Lansman. Um, I'm going to continue in the absence of Councilmember Johnson, and I'm going to ask specifically about the pre-considered intro that's on our agenda sponsored by the speaker that relates to requiring Mock J to make the efforts to address outstanding criminal warrants and issue an annual report related to the, these activities. Um, in your testimony, Alex, you talked about OCA and NYPD as well as the warrant system, there being some sort of a merging. Can you give me an idea in terms of the timeline of when this is going to happen? Um, so as far as the, do you mean the 600,000 warrants that were clear, or do you mean just systemically making sure that the systems talk to each other? Because it's two different questions. 
I always want to make sure we're talking to each other. But so I guess, yes, the latter part, but then also the 600000 that we talked about with the four district attorneys, when you will actually see that on the system. So that, that I'll start with that one because it's easier. Okay. Um, so m most of them have actually been vacated um, in, in all of the systems. Um, there is a little bit of a, a legacy system at OCA that still needs to be caught up. I think it's around 30,000 are remaining, but the vast okay. majority of the warrants have been vacated and no longer appear on anybody's records. Um, so that was good, and it was a lot of very hard work by, by OCA and, and working very closely with the PD. Um, the larger question about the systems talking to each other, you know, I won't speak for the PD, but I know that, you know, as a result of this warrant clearing process, there's been a lot of really great conversations between the IT people at OCA and the IT people at PD on ensuring that those databases talk to each other. And that work had been ongoing actually before this as well, as there had been a discussion about making sure the, the, the databases are married. Um, I think they're in a pretty good uh, spot. I don't know if Oleg has any more details on that other than that work is ongoing and I think is, is, is overdue and, and a good, good step forward in the system. Okay, great. That's good to hear. Um, do we know how many today, how many misdemeanor warrants are currently active? Is that something that uh, Off Mark the top Jay of my head, know? I don't. I believe the total number of warrants before we cleared was 1.5 million. So it's under a million at this point with, um, with the reduction in the summonses, but that includes felony warrants. You know, that's not just okay. summons warrants. Okay, misdemeanor and felony. Correct. Okay. That's a lot. Um, that's a lot. It is a lot, and, 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 you know, I think we think it's a lot as well, which is why, you know, this clearing of the warrants is not our only WARN initiative. Um, you know, I think going forward, there will be a significant reduction in the number that are issued, uh, largely because of the CJRA. You know, a lot of them are summons warrants, and a good amount of those will no longer result in a warrant. Um, but we're thinking sort of more holistically about how to get people to come back to court, how to sort of destigmatize showing up to court, and, and really having people clear their own warrants, um, because they can, and most people just don't know that. Okay. What is the, the department, what is Mock J doing, like you said, to just increase New Yorkers' ability to understand what's happening with their outstanding warrants, um, how they can really come to get them cleared? I mean, the challenge, unfortunately, that we're dealing with is that many New Yorkers just don't feel safe going to court. Um, sometimes when they leave court, there are individuals waiting to arrest them, right? It happens, and it's been happening more often than not. Um, with some of the non-local law enforcement agencies specifically, um, and I've known that to be the case. I've talked to many of the public defenders, and that has been the case. So understanding that that's going on, how do we provide more assurance for New Yorkers that they can be safe coming to court, um, letting them know what's going on with their warrant and how they can get it cleared up? Yeah, I mean, that's the, it's a million dollar question. So luckily, you know, we haven't seen that sort of enforcement in, in, in sort of the summons context. Um, so our message is always that the summons courts are open and you can go and clear your warrant at any time. Um, you don't even have to go to the borough that your warrant exists. You can go to any, any summons court and you can clear any summons in any borough. Um, but we've actually hired a, a firm to interview New Yorkers, interview people who are in the system, uh, interview public defenders to find out sort of what is impeding people from, from coming back to court and clearing their warrants. Um, we, our hypothesis is a lot of people just don't know they have warrants. Um, and then we're hoping to roll out some interventions as a result of that research to get people to proactively clear their warrants. You know, I think the work of the district attorneys and their Begin Again programs or, you know, what each of the district attorney's offices has their own sort of name um, have been great, but we, we really want is a more systemic sort of always come in. And so that's research that's going on right now, and I think we should have results, you know, by early next year. Okay. With the expected merging of the warrant systems, both for the city and the state, do you think that it would be easier for Mock J to look at the legislation 1636 that Councilmember Johnson is proposing that would ensure that we try to address erroneous criminal records? While I know it's a challenge because we do have to rely on our partnership and relationship with the state, but for every mistake or error that's made, it's someone's life and their future that is the consequence. And so obviously to the extent that we can avoid that, we certainly all want to do. Um, and so in, in the world that I live in, right, a city official, formerly a state official, we just have to do work together. We don't have a choice. Um, so do you think that once the merger happens, it would be easier to, to try to address erroneous records and be able to um, satisfy a lot of those 
errors that were done and, and get them corrected? So, so I agree. It's not something where we can just throw up our hands and say, well, it's the state, so there's nothing we can do. Um, so I think we're eager to have conversations with the state about this topic. Um, ultimately, you know, the, I'm sure the law department will be very sort of vigilant about committing in legislation to creating that process just because, you know, this, once you start those conversations, there's a million reasons why people, you know, throw up barriers and you try to break them down. But just being legislatively required to, to come to a solution with people you don't control um, is always the challenge. But I think we definitely support the goal. Um, and we want to work towards a system where, you know, clearing rap sheets is something that's easier than it is right now. Okay. Oh, yes. We used to call them rap sheets. Yes, that's right. Um, do you know, does anyone, does Mock J keep a record of how many errors are on criminal records today? We don't. Do you know who does? Um, well, I heard some stats from the Legal Action Center. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know where those are derived from. Certainly okay. we hear a lot anecdotally. Um, certainly if people have information, we'd be happy to hear it. But I think a lot of it is unknown because it, it's until a defense attorney or a client sees the, the sheet and says, oh, wow, wait, this was supposed to be sealed or, you know, I wasn't convicted of that um, or this case was disposed. So a lot of the errors are unknown. Okay. Um, I believe Legal Action Center will, is here and will testify later, but someone should be responsible for maintaining the accuracy of criminal records. Don't you agree? Uh, I agree. Um, I, I don't want to point to the state, uh, but, you know, state D suggests that is uh, their responsibility at the end of the day is to maintain criminal records. But again, there's a lot of information that flows in there. So I'm not blaming these suggests, certainly not, you know, uh, paperwork gets mixed up and it's not excusable, but it does happen. And a lot of people have a hand in that, which is I understand why, what the impetus for this legislation is and why we think it's a laudable goal. Right. Okay. So uh, while Council Member Johnson's not here, but I certainly know that the thought behind the legislation itself was to ensure that everyone's records obviously are clear. But if we are looking at the existing records of how many errors there are on individuals' criminal records, I am absolutely sure that there is a pattern with men and women of color that are obviously uh, more subjected to having errors on their criminal records. And that's unacceptable. It's unacceptable for anyone to have an error on their record, but let alone a targeted population. Um, and so it's important for this council, it's important for all of us to make sure that we continue to talk about this issue because whether it's Mock J or OCA, DCJS, somebody needs to take responsibility for maintaining the accuracy of criminal records. I think it's, it's fair to say that everyone has a right to make sure that their record is clear because your record essentially is your name and your character and who you are. And, you know, we use that to judge people in terms of their future, their future employment, their future ability to be a good citizen, right? And so all of that is weighed in terms of an individual. And so if your record is messed up, then your character is floored. And, and I think that's, you know, an argument that many young people say all the time, you know, it's not who I am, but this is the record on paper. So I hope that we'll continue to keep talking to Mock J about this um, to make sure that we can get to some sort of a resolution on um, erroneous records. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I believe... The last item I wanted to just raise is another pre-considered resolution. I wanted to ask specifically about the Hearing Protection Act. I don't like that name. Um, the Hearing Protection Act of 2017, which is essentially the firearm licensor bill. And I wanted to get, obviously, I know it's a pre-considered resolution, but would there be any way in the city of New York that someone today could legally obtain a silencer in New York City? Uh, no, a, a silencers are illegal under the state penal law, and uh, I believe so are the weapons that can accept a silencer. However, with respect to the legislation moving around uh, D.C., I think what what this bill does is, one, it removes the, the heavy tax that's applied to the purchase, purchase of silencers, because mm -hmm. although they're illegal in New York State, they are legal in other states. I, I don't have the list of what they are, but I believe it was over 10 states where silencers are legal. Um, so it would, one, it would remove the heavy tax on silencers, two, it would eliminate the need for an individual looking to purchase a silencer to undergo a background check, which I believe is, is the case now under, under federal law. So, I mean, our concern 
with respect to this bill would be, one, how, how would that interplay with state law? Does that essentially override? Is there a, is there a, does, does the state law become a preemption issue? In which case, the silencers would be able to bleed into, into New York State. Mm -hmm. Two, even if that's not the case, I think the, the increased demand for silencers will result in the increased production of silencers thereby leading to the increased availability of silencers. And the detriment here, at least, would be, one, it would impede shot spotters' ability to detect gunshots. Two, it would impede the ability of individuals that hear gunshots and report shots fired through 911. It would impede their ability to actually recognize that a shot has been fired, uh, which in turn would lead to us having delayed responses to the scenes of shootings, uh, potentially if a shooting happened within a house or an apartment, uh, the neighbors wouldn't be able to hear that the shot happened, and we may very well be responding to complaints of, of a foul odor in an apartment building, which would be an individual that was shot possibly days, if not weeks, before, although nobody would have heard the shot happen. So we have many concerns over that legislation. Okay, I, I share your concerns. And I think moving forward, you know, the real possibility that this Hearing Protection Act may pass in both houses is a scary thing. It's scary to even talk about the possibility of having silencers um, permitted in this city and in this state. Um, do you know if, if, if the department is planning or is there anything that the department is looking to do to make sure that we raise our voices of opposition to make sure that our, especially our New York delegation, is aware of what's pending in both houses and making sure that they understand that we are unequivocally, uh, without doubt, opposed to this measure? Yes, yeah, so uh, I can tell you with certainty that both the police commissioner and the mayor have been very forceful in their opposition to both the silencer law, the Hearing Protection Act, as well as the Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act. Uh, and they have spoken to, to our delegation and have voiced their serious concerns with respect to the legislation. Okay, more to come. Um, I don't think in light of everything going on, we certainly don't want um, these proposals to move. Um, without us making sure that we are extremely voiceful. Um, this city, this administration, we've done so much work on cure violence and anti-gun violence initiatives, all of the advocacy groups. I mean, we have done a tremendous amount of work. Um, I refuse to let my work go um, for, for, for not. This is something that's going to have a detrimental impact on New Yorkers and make us unsafe. And certainly, you know, whatever we need to keep doing, we have to continue to raise the, the conversation. Um, it's unfortunate that so many residents that we know in my district and all across the city have been impacted by gun violence. I told the chief that last week I visited a mother in my district whose son was murdered and she just came back from burying him. She took him back home and, you know, now mom wants to relocate. She doesn't want to live in the Bronx anymore. And I can't blame her. I don't blame a mom for living in her apartment for almost 30 years for now wanting to move because she doesn't want to live in the house where her son lived with her who's no longer here. And those stories we hear far too often, and we know that this is because of the plague of illegal handguns that we have across our city. So I appreciate the efforts of the department and certainly um, ask you to continue to raise your voices, and certainly uh, as we can be of support, we definitely want to make sure we do as well. Right, and uh, and it should be said that we appreciate your support and the support of the council in 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 the fight against uh, what could be, what's potentially very dangerous legislation. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, with that, my colleague did not return, so I'm going to thank this panel for coming today, and certainly your work, your commitment, your testimony, and we look forward to continuing the conversation on not just the legislation before the committee, but I think for me as chair, it allows an opportunity to further understand how the detective bureau works, how we focus on clearance rates and, you know, dealing with the seven major index crimes, how we focus on traffic 
um, and transit violations, how we focus on the warrant system and erroneous records. I mean, this is all relative to creating a safer city, but also allowing us to be more efficient in the work we do. So um, while there was a legislative agenda of legislation and resolutions, certainly the topics are very meaningful, and we will continue to talk about those in the days ahead. So I thank you for coming, and as I always do, you know it's my practice, um, I ask you to leave someone behind, um, both from Mock J and the NYPD, to hear the remaining testimony from our legal service providers and many of the advocates that are going to offer some very thoughtful testimony on today's agenda. So if you could do that, we would really appreciate it, and we thank you once again for coming. Thank you. Do we have, oh, okay, thank you once again to our first panel. Our next panel is someone who I know very well, a former colleague of mine I had the honor of serving with in the New York State Assembly. He is the prime sponsor of legislation before the state before the governor that focuses on a very important topic that we are discussing today and have been discussing related to gravity knives, Assembly Bill 5667A and Senate Bill S4769A in relation to gravity knives in New York State. Um, I'd like to recognize and have him come forward, the Assembly Member of the 73rd District, Assembly Member Dan Court. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Is your mic on? Yes. Okay, great. You can begin. Thanks again. Thank you for an opportunity to speak at today's hearing, and thank you to Council Member and Chair Gibson for introducing resolution number 1660. Uh, I'm deeply appreciative of you bringing this issue to the Council's attention and for your leadership on the issue. In, in 1958, the state legislature enacted the original gravity knife statute to prohibit possession of a World War II era German weapon that opened by the force of gravity. Since then, enforcement of the statute has expanded, primarily in Manhattan, to apply to any common folding knife. As Council Member Gibson uh, will note in her resolution, between four and 5,000 New Yorkers are arrested every year for possession of a simple pocket knife. In effect, a state law has been used by police and prosecutors in one area of the state to outlaw a tool that is perfectly legal in the rest of the state. This practice has left New Yorkers in an untenable situation. What's worse, these knives are widely available from online retailers and stores outside of New York City, as well as retailers right here in Manhattan. While the Manhattan District Attorney, Cy Vance, garnered plenty of press coverage in 2010 by cracking down on these realtors, seizing their infant inventory and fining retailers over $900,000, he never fulfilled his promise to spend that money on a knife education program to inform New Yorkers of what, of what knives he would prosecute them for possessing. How can New Yorkers possibly be expected to understand what knives are legal under these circumstances? Even more telling, when District Attorney Vance negotiated deferred prosecution agreements with these real t re retailers, he allowed one retailer, Paragon Sports, to continue selling expensive knives that he otherwise would have found in violation of the penal code, simply because they carried a high price tag. As one of the assistant district attorneys explained during a deposition, the DA did not believe that expensive knives would be used to commit violent acts so those knives were exempted. While those who can afford to pay top dollar for higher end knives have experienced no consequences under this regime, New Yorkers who need an affordable folding knife for work have been arrested and prosecuted in droves since District Attorney Vance took office in Manhattan. The racial disparities in enforcement practices are equally as appalling. 
86% of those arrested are charged with pocket knife possession are black and Hispanic, and people of color face stronger penalties at each step of the prosecutorial process from arrest to arraignment to sentencing. Over the last several years, I've worked with my colleague, Senator Diane Savino, to pass legislation that would end this plainly discriminatory practice. Our coalition is unprecedentedly broad, including everyone from upstate Second Amendment supporters to legal aid and other public defenders, from the Safari Club to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. This legislation passed nearly unanimously in each house of the legislature. In a time of deep political polarization, New Yorkers from all across the political spectrum and from every corner of the state have come together to say that it is long past time to fix our broken knife laws. However, no support could have as much impact as that of the New York City Council. Each council member sees the impact of this discriminatory enforcement every day in your districts, whether your constituents live in Manhattan or simply travel to here into Manhattan. The council supported this legislation is a clear message to the governor that he should stand with everyday New Yorkers, the working New Yorkers, and the New Yorkers of color who have been unfairly affected by this unjust policy, and not with District Attorney Cy Vance of Manhattan. I urge you to vote yes on this resolution, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Assemblymember. I appreciate your presence, your testimony, and certainly your leadership, along with Senator Diane Savino, has been amazing. Um, and I do know that the Assembly, the Senate passed it unanimously, and the Assembly had passed by a vote of? I think uh, 120 to 1. Or it was one assembly member that voted no. One, one of our, one of your, one of your former colleagues voted no. Yes. Okay. So I wanted to ask a question. Um, I know in your testimony and just in general, we've talked a lot about um, D. A. Vance. I mean, he was one of the heavy DAs, including the DA's association, that was opposed to the measure. Um, have the other four district attorneys of the city of New York weighed in on this? Because obviously, gravity knives are an issue that's happening across the state of New York, but obviously most prevalent in New York County. But have you received any feedback from the other four DAs? Um, I, I think the, the criticism of District Attorney Vance has is, is been appropriate in that he prosecutes these, uh, th these matters four times more than all the other DAs combined. Uh, specifically, if you look at the numbers of other district attorneys in New York City, while they're it continues to be some prosecution, and in my view, one prosecution is too much. The, the numbers are plainly much smaller in the other four boroughs. Um, mm -hmm. okay. I have not had specific contact. I don't know the position of each of the other four district attorneys with respect to my legislation, but the, certainly the prosecutorial levels in the Bronx, in Queens, in Brooklyn, and in Staten Island are far lower and far more reduced than what they are in Manhattan. Okay, so can you answer a question? Um, it seems like the city of New York moves forward in prosecuting these cases as compared to other parts of New York State. So because there is a dominance in the minority community, African American and Latino men and women, are you noticing that in some of the other five regions? And when I say five regions, obviously New York City, but I also want to include maybe Yonkers, Syracuse, Rochester, and Buffalo, right? The big five. Yes, um, in upstate communities where, where there are uh, uh, large minority communities well, Buffalo and, and other parts of the state, uh, I am not aware of any district attorney who prosecutes gravity knife laws. Um, this is a wholly New York City approach, and it is, even within that context, it is the district attorney here in Manhattan, Cy Vance, more so than any of the other four DAs who prosecutes this particular uh, uh, offense. And uh, so to, the answer to your question is I'm not aware of any district attorney outside of New York City who prosecutes this penal code or penal law violation. Um, and from your understanding, I know you've done a lot of work on this legislation, and I know how hard it is to get bills passed in the state, <laughs> right? So I commend you that you have not only gotten it through the Assembly, but also the Senate, and it, you know, lies with the governor to sign into local law. Um, 
the common scenario of young men and women who are arrested for gravity knives, is it typically because many of them have an, in their possession gravity knives for the purposes of work? Or are there other reasons that you found? So tell me a little bit about, from your perspective, right, because I'm going to speak to a lot of the legal advocates as well that represent many of their clients that are caught up with gravity knives. But from your perspective, what has been the common scenario of many New Yorkers that are arrested for possession of gravity knives? Well, I think my, certainly my, my, my fellow colleagues and practicing attorneys uh, can, can provide you greater description because they're the ones each and every day standing in a courtroom defending um, people who've been arrested on this. But I'll say from my experience and from my uh, limited experience also being in the courtroom and having defended an actual gravity knife case, uh, it was a workplace situation. Um, the individual in this particular circumstances was on his way to work. He was outside a bodega and he was stopped for reasons he didn't even understand. And then the officer performed a flick test, which the legal aid attorneys will describe in, in greater detail, and he was arrested. But what was significant to me is that the matter was disposed of at the uh, arraignment part in the first instance. And, and that tells you a lot because it tells you that we're dealing with working people. And there's been discussions about uh, District Attorney Vance set forth that there should be an affirmative defense but for most working people, they don't have the opportunity to have multiple days off. They can't take days off from work, or they have child care responsibilities. They can't come back to court. So they plead to whatever the district attorney's offer is because they know they can't afford to come back to court. That's why this crime, uh, as it's been prosecuted by the district attorneys and spe specifically Cy Vance, is so disproportionate to working people because it punishes them even more. It punishes poverty. And that's why I fought for three or four years with the advocates and legal aid society to get to a point where we can say that something that isn't criminal is no longer punished by the penal law of the state of New York. Okay, uh, I agree. In your testimony, you talked about one of the ADAs in New York County describing uh, a defendant that had an expensive knife that they assumed would be used, that they did not believe would be used to commit a violent yes, act. Um, so are we saying that those that have the less expensive and more affordable knives are more likely to commit a crime with the gravity knife? Well, we are not saying that. Cy Vance, we, the we. district attorney in Manhattan, is saying right. that uh, by his deferred prosecution agreement, he makes clear that he is the arbiter of which knives are used for what purpose. And by the terms of that deferred prosecution agreement, so Vance believes that higher-end knives purchased by people who have the financial means to buy higher-end knives are not worthy of being prosecuted by his office. But working people, poor people, thousands of people, 4,000 people a year, many in Manhattan, he deems those people worth prosecuting. Okay. Right, and I'm glad you clarified it. I didn't mean we as in us. <laughs> no, <Okay>. I... <laughs> Um, the other question I have is, you know, and representing a community of men and women of color that, you know, face harsher penalties under what we want to be an equal system of justice um, and not one system for those that can afford a lawyer and those that cannot be subjected to uh, less representation and ultimately ending up convicted of possessing a gravity knife. There are a lot of New Yorkers that are sitting in prison today yes. because they have been convicted of possessing gravity knives. It's and to every effort that we can give them a second chance, allow them an opportunity to, number one, be released and have a second opportunity at life, but also the preventative work that we do. Um, I like to do preventative work as well as reacting to a crisis. And I think, you know, outside of your legislation, this is a topic that has not received a lot of widespread conversation. Right, and so I'm grateful that the legislation is raising that level of awareness. It's stimulating a real conversation. Mm -hmm. And so having the resolution on today's agenda was really an opportunity to do that. There are a lot of individuals that are affected every single day by gravity knives. And unless you're one of them or you know someone, most people don't understand what's happening. So I wanted to ask specifically, how can we level the playing field? So if you are a carpenter or an electrician and you have a gravity knife for the purposes of work, 
let's say you purchase that at Home Depot or a local hardware store, right? There are many in the industry that are saying we should hold the sellers of these products to some level of standard. So if it's deemed legal and you're able to purchase it at a local store, then why are we subjecting the individual to one standard of justice and not holding the local hardware stores accountable as well? Well, that, that's absolutely right. There has been no effort made by either city government or or any district attorney's office to really hold on a widespread basis retailers responsible for selling folding knives that open by force of gravity. Uh, it's been the worst of both worlds. There's been no effort to uh, regulate the retailers, but at the same time there's been a disproportionate effort to punish those who purchase those folding knives from these realtors. So it's been the worst of both worlds uh, in the way in which uh, gra gravity knives has been not enforced and then prosecuted. Okay. And I guess my final question is the million dollar question. Yes. Do we expect the governor to sign this legislation into law? Uh, we, we do. I do. <laughs> um, and I, I think just to two questions earlier, and I, want, I really want to thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for bringing this. But you will, when the legal aid attorneys uh, speak, you'll hear about a term I know you know, but maybe people listening will hear called a bump up. And, and that is one of the worst things. You talk about people in state prison for possession of a folding knife. It, many people at home are listening in New Yorkers. They can't believe that it's true, but it is true. And you're going to hear from the legal aid lawyers who talk about a bump up and what it is to be representing a client and disproportionately and almost always a person of color, and they're going to state prison because they had possession of a folding knife. These are real stories about New Yorkers who are suffering, suffering grievous consequence, consequences for something they purchase in a hardware store. So uh, my hope is the governor, when he's contemplating signing this bill, he thinks about those individuals, those New Yorkers, and if he does, I'm cautiously optimistic he will sign this legislation. Is this the first piece of legislation that's been proposed, uh, potentially enacted, um, since 1958? 58. Um, I, I don't think there's Other been... Other than changes you described by the Manhattan DA, I mean, has there been a lot of work on this in the state? No, I'm not aware of, I'm not aware of any other legislative um, acti activity on this bill. In, in, in fairness, um, I think uh, our difficult history in this city would stop and frisk, and gravity knives or folding knives being a predicate for those stops highlighted the need for legislation. So it, it is, I think, historically, it's a more recent phenomena, this overzealous prosecution of people carrying folding knives. Okay. Well, I think that's it. Thank Thanks. you so much uh, for coming today. Thank you for your testimony Thank and all you. of the work you're doing on um, gravity knives and this legislation. Certainly looking forward to working with you. Um, I do know there's a time frame that the mm -hmm. governor has to consider the legislation before um, his office. And, you know, I will work with you in those days. I mean, moving forward and once the deadline arrives, um, whatever happens, obviously, I want them to support it as well. But, you know, you have my commitment to continue to work with you. I mean, this is a topic very, very important and very personal to me because I represent many of the clients that are represented by Legal Aid and others that are affected, you know. They get caught up in a system, but the system needs to change. Mm. Um, and so I recognize that. So even outside of this legislation, I do think that there's a broader conversation that we definitely need to have with the NYPD, the district attorneys, and we also need to talk to retailers, right? Like this issue is not going to go away. While we may not prosecute these cases, um, we're not going to stop an industry that needs a folding knife to work. Right? So we need to make sure that we're giving them the options of being safe. We want to make sure everyone's safe at the end of the day. Um, so I look forward to working with you with the legislation as well as outside on the broader conversation around gravity knives. Thank you so much, Madam Thank Chair. you very much. Thank you for coming today. Okay. 
Our next panel that we're calling forward for today's hearing is Martin LaFace from the Legal Aid Society, Hara Robrisk from the Legal Aid Society, Kate Wagner Goldstein, Legal Action Center, Judy Whiting from Community Service Society, and Esty Connor, Community Service Society of New York. Can I call everyone? I got everyone, right? Okay, Martin Tier, SD, Kate, Judy, and Hara. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Martin, you want to begin? Yes. You're Chair the sole woman. man at the table, Chair surrounded woman. by phenomenal women. Chairwoman Gibson, <laughs> thank, thank you so much for having us. My name is Martin LaFalse. I'm a public defender with the Legal Aid Society. Um, and I think my testimony is better presented as testimony on um, fairness within the criminal justice system and equal enforcement of the law, not as testimony regarding knives. Uh, my colleague, Hera Robrish, and I are public defenders, um, and we are committed to seeing reform in this area of the criminal justice system because um, it is um, the most discriminatory law um, in New York State. It's the most discriminatory law um, in New York City. And despite calls for reform, um, the New York State's gravity knife law continues to be enforced in a discriminatory way. Um, I've shown you this picture before, and I'd like to show the audience this picture. Um, on February 3rd, 2011, Elliot Perilla um, was finishing a tiling job in East Harlem. And when he finished the tiling job in East Harlem, um, he had this Husky Home Depot utility knife that he had been using. He took the knife along with his other tools, he put it into his car, and he was driving home from East Harlem to the Bronx. Uh, he had a broken taillight, and police pulled him over for the broken taillight. They searched his car, they searched his person, there were tools in his car, including this Husky Home Depot knife that he had purchased at Home Depot in the Bronx. A police officer was able to flick this knife open with one hand, and so Perilla was arrested and charged with so-called gravity knife possession. Normally, when someone is charged with possession of a gravity knife, they face a misdemeanor prosecution, but because Elliot Perilla had a previous criminal conviction, he faced um, what Assemblyman Court referred to as a felony bump up. Because whenever someone has a previous conviction, no matter what it was for, no matter how long ago that conviction was, if they're found in possession of a knife that a police officer can force open with one hand, they face felony prosecution and seven years in prison. At trial, it was no defense for Elliot Perillo that he purchased the knife at Home Depot. It was no defense that he used it for work. It was no defense um, that he wasn't threatening anyone with it. Um, he had no defense. The police officer was able to flick it open. Cy Vance's office charged Perilla with a felony. Perilla was convicted at trial. He was sentenced to two and a half to five years in state prison. Okay. His knife, this Husky Home Depot knife, is sold at almost every hardware store in New York City. It's sold throughout the state. It's sold throughout the country. Um, I am not here as a knife rights advocate. I am here in support of equal enforcement of the law. 
We've told this story in the press. We've told this story to the assembly. We've told this story to the governor's office. We've told this story to the mayor. You directed NYPD to stay after their testimony. Had they stayed, I would tell them right now that there is nothing that prevents them from going into any hardware store in New York City and arresting those retailers who sell this knife if they intend to, force, to enforce the law equally. Last year, when Governor Cuomo vetoed um, the previous gravity knife reform bill, he said the following of the state of the law. Under current New York law and practice, knives that are classified as gravity knives are designed, marketed, and sold as work tools for construction workers and day laborers at a variety of major retailers across the state. However, any person who goes into a store and purchases the product can be subsequently arrested and prosecuted for mere possession. This construct is absurd. And it is absurd. It's a trap. And as Assemblyman Court explained, 86% of those people who are stopped and prosecuted for so-called gravity knife possession are black and Latino. At the height of stop and frisk, there were over 6,000 people who were arrested every year for so-called gravity knife possession. Now, post stop and frisk, there are approximately 4,000 people who are arrested every year in New York City for so-called gravity knife possession. Since the governor's veto December 31st, 2016, we have found over 110 stores in Manhattan alone, we didn't even look at the other boroughs, but in Manhattan alone, um, where the knives are sold. We know that in 2006, Antoine Best, one of our clients who was an employee of Starbucks, had a folding knife that he purchased online. He was prosecuted by the Manhattan DA's office. First time his case was tried, there was a hung jury. The Manhattan DA's office tried him again. They wanted to prove that he was in possession of an illegal weapon, even though there was no allegation that he intended to use it unlawfully or threatened anyone with it. That second trial, he was convicted. He was sentenced to two and a half to five years in prison. Today, 2017, Antoine Best knife that he was stopped for in 2006 and received two and a half to five years in state prison can be found right now at 115 West 26th Street at Westfall Company. It's in the glass case at the shelf. If NYPD had stayed, I would ask you to direct them to go to Westfall to enforce the law equally. They haven't done that. Richard Neal was convicted of possessing um, a folding knife um, in 2008. He was sentenced to three to six years in state prison. There's no allegation that he ever intended to use his knife unlawfully. He'd never threatened anyone with the knife. It was a folding knife that NYPD recovered after stopping him and frisking him. Okay. That knife is sold online at Lowe's. I personally saw that knife and photographed that knife at Lowe's in Brooklyn in 2015, so seven years after Richard Neal was convicted of felony possession of a weapon and spent six years in prison, NYPD did not utilize their awesome resources to go to Brooklyn, to go to the store, take the knife off the shelf. This is a shameful law. It's a shameful practice. And there's no other side to equal enforcement of the law. Um, we are thrilled that you are shedding light on this practice. We are thrilled that the council um, is showing a concern about this unequal enforcement of the law, and we, we applaud your efforts. Turn it over to my colleague. That was a great way to start. Thank you. <laughs> sure. All right, now you have to do better. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can do that, but thank you so much for introducing uh, this resolution. Is your microphone on? Oh. Okay, you sound really low. Yeah, make sure the red button. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> um, thank you so much for introducing this legislation. Uh, 
I represented Mustafa Muhammad when he was arrested for possessing a gravity knife and charged with a felony. Because Mustafa had a prior felony record, as Marty discussed, uh, his case was bumped up to a felony and he was facing seven years in prison. Mustafa Muhammad was arrested across the street from his construction site at Delco Electric while he was on a short break. When he was arrested, he was carrying an ordinary utility knife, a knife similar to the knife that uh, we passed out, um, a knife that's considered a necessary work tool in the construction trade. Mustafa got his job at Delco through a parole program called Center for Employment Opportunity, or CEO. It was this program that helped him get a job in construction. At the end of his job training, he was given a stipend and instructed to go to a hardware store in the Bronx to purchase construction tools. It was at this hardware store in the Bronx that he purchased a list of construction tools as well as a utility knife. On the day of his arrest, Mustafa was carrying this utility knife along with other tools. When Mustafa was arrested, his utility, I'm sorry, when he was arrested, his foreman came rushing over to tell the police that Mustafa worked for him and that he used the knife as part of his job. But the police did not care. They arrested him anyway. They also did not care that he was arrested across the street from his construction site or that he had purchased the knife in New York City in the Bronx. As a result of this gravity knife arrest, Mustafa spent over a month in jail on a parole violation. It is usual for people in construction to carry their tools to and from a construction site because the sites are unsecured. If the tools are left lying around, they could go missing or construction workers, because construction workers do not have desks or offices at the site to lock up their tools. Mustafa Muhammad was lucky because after a lot of effort and investigation, I was able to convince the district attorney not to indict him for a felony and to dismiss his case. However, most people arrested in New York County for a gravity knife that have a prior felony record are not so lucky. Mustafa Muhammad never knew he was carrying anything that could be considered an illegal weapon. Mustafa Muhammad, like thousands of other people in New York City, was arrested for purchasing a gravity knife in a hardware store, a knife that had no warning and he had no reason to believe it was unlawful. NYPD and Cy Vance have opposed gravity knife reform legislation repeatedly, citing public safety concerns and claiming that gravity knives are uniquely dangerous. So after this bill was vetoed by the governor last year, and uh, the main concern, as I discussed, is, was public safety, we did an internal review of our data. And we found that these claims were unfounded and unsupported by the data. We reviewed every violent felony complaint from July 1, 2016 through December 1, 2016, where a weapon was recovered. This was over 1,800 complaints, and Marty and I reviewed several hundred of them ourselves, uh, and then our, with our colleagues. Uh, together, we looked at over 1,800 complaints. And from those complaints, there were over 2,000 weapons recovered. We logged each and every weapon and found that gravity knives made up less than 2% of the weapons recovered in violent felonies, and that they were used in a violent or threatening way in less than 1% of the cases. Belts, canes, crutches, bats, glass bottles, scissors, and hammers were all used more often in the commission of violent felonies than so-called gravity knives. And all of those items are lawful to possess. So one of the issues that we have is NYPD continues to claim these public safety concerns. However, this law does not prevent the NYPD from arresting anyone who is committing a crime, anyone who is threatening any person with a knife, or using a knife unlawfully in any way. They can still be arrested under the law for that. 
we're talking about mere possession. Our clients that possess these knives work as construction workers, maintenance workers, electricians, chefs, movers, stagehands, bless you, <laughs> uh, stockroom workers, as well as in many other blue collar jobs. <laughs> the collateral consequences, even for a person that is arrested for the first time, is severe. Our clients spent a night in jail before they see a judge. They miss days of work to come to court appearances. Many lose their job just as a result of the arrest, even when their boss knows that they are using a knife as part of their job. These individuals, as I've stated, are usually blue collar workers and missing even a day of work jeopardizes their job. And they're also, most of them are only paid for the days that they work. So this can become a financial burden if they have to appear on multiple court appearances to resolve the case. In addition, in order for not to get a misdemeanor, the cases are resolved many times with a fine or community service. And that's additional days of work that these individuals have to miss and more money that they need to uh, spend, which is another financial hardship for hardworking New Yorkers. So it's for all of these reasons that we want to thank you so much for introducing this resolution that we ask uh, council members to vote yes on this resolution and that we ask the governor uh, the state of New York to sign this bill into law. Okay, great. Thank you. you did better than Martin. You guys are good. All right. Now it's your turn. You have to do better. I love it. We get better and better. Thank you. Testimonies are amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your passion. And I had a chance to meet with both of you. And I know that this is very, very important to you. So I appreciate it. And thank you for highlighting the stories. I mean, it's great that you're here. But when you hear the names, of individuals that are coming from our communities that are victims in this process, it just makes it even more real for all of us. So I thank you for sharing a lot of those stories. Um, it's really important for the broader public to know. So thank you so much. Thank you. Your turn. Hello. Um, I'm here to address introduction number uh, 1636, the bill to mandate mayor's office of criminal justice uh, to address erroneous errors, okay. um, erroneous criminal records, thank you. So my name is Kate Wagner Goldstein. I'm an attorney at the Legal Action Center, a public interest law and policy organization specializing in issues involving the criminal justice system, alcohol and drug addiction, and HIV or AIDS. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to address these two important bills today. I plan to also address the bill um, to address uh, warrants. Um, I'm not sure if I should do this now. Um, should I address both of them at the same time? Thank you. Okay. okay. You can do it all. Great. Thank you. So to start with the bill um, addressing erroneous criminal records, uh, this is a huge problem in New York City, um, as you are well aware. Hundreds of thousands of New York City residents are likely to have a criminal record with errors. These errors can derail people's lives, preventing them from getting jobs, licenses, housing, and sometimes even dealing with more personal matters, like being able to formally adopt a grandchild or other relative. Errors are currently incredibly time-consuming to fix, requiring traveling in person to try to obtain documents, often going from one office to another office to another office. When the city council held a hearing on the problem of rap sheet errors last year, one of our clients testified about his experience starting at the court clerk's office, being sent to the DA's office, then being sent to the police precinct, and finally to one police plaza. And there, still no one could find any record of the cases he was there to address or provide any assistance. That experience is common. The current system for correcting errors simply does not work. Even when advocates like us get involved, we run into some of the same roadblocks and the process takes far too much time. We need an office to coordinate getting responses to these errors from the various agencies involved and helping this system 
both for advocates like us, as well as for individuals who don't necessarily find the offices that can provide additional assistance and need to correct these errors on their own. The Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice could play this valuable coordinating role. They have experience taking on this type of role with a similar range of agencies. For example, um, as an integral part of the Justice Reboot Initiative in, um, recently to modernize the criminal justice system. Mock J can work with each agency to ensure processes are in place to provide the documents that are required to correct the various different types of errors. The process should operate electronically so people do not need to appear in person in each office to obtain the required documents. And there should be other steps taken to streamline these processes. We note that Mock J's role coordinating these efforts would not supplant the work of legal service providers. Providers still need additional resources to help individuals in the first place to identify errors on their rap sheets and then to help start the process of error correction. But our work would be much more efficient and have much greater impact if the error correction process could be streamlined by a centralized office. We also applaud the bill's requirement that Mock J ensure the public is aware of the error correction system. And as part of this publicity effort, we ask that the bill also require that Mock J publicize New York State's brand new law that allows people to seal certain criminal convictions. That law went into effect last week, and there is not enough public awareness of it, so we would ask that they try to increase awareness of that at the same time. As part of this bill, the New York Police Department should also be required to create an easily accessible and publicized process to provide the documents needed to correct certain errors. They alone have the documents necessary for certain types of errors, and it can be very difficult to obtain it currently, um, obtain those kinds of documents currently. In general, all agencies should be producing the documents needed for error correction within two days. Currently, it can take weeks to get the documents corrected. Um, New York City's Fair Chance Act requires employers to hold open jobs for only three days while applicants attempt to address concerns regarding their criminal background. While employers can, of course, hold them open beyond that, many employers do not. And so individuals need, an need to be able to correct these errors quickly enough that the job will still be available once they do. The Legal Action Center also strongly supports the bill that requires the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to address outstanding warrants. Inaccurate warrant information and open warrants are a huge problem in New York City. It is essential that the police department's records of outstanding warrants are kept up to date and that New Yorkers have more opportunity to vacate their warrants. Um, we thank you again for your commitment to both of these issues, and we would welcome the opportunity to continue to work with you on developing these bills going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, very much. We really appreciate it. We're gonna get those bills passed. <laughs> Thank you. We're going out of order here a little bit. Because <laughs> it makes sense contextually. Is the microphone on? Ah, okay. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much to Chair Gibson and to the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify today in support of both intro number 1636 and intro uh, 6381 regarding warrants. I'll first speak about intro 1636, which would amend the administrative code of, the New, York City, of New York City to require the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to address erroneous criminal records. My name is Esty Connor, and I'm an attorney at the Community Service Society, or CSS. CSS is a nonprofit organization with a 175-year history of excellence in addressing the root causes of economic disparity in New York through research, advocacy, litigation, and innovative program models that benefit all New Yorkers. Several CSS programs provide services to the most vulnerable New Yorkers, including justice-involved individuals. Because having a conviction history substantially undermines an individual's chances of full participation in the community, CSS's legal department focuses exclusively on advocacy, policy, and litigation approaches to combating criminal records-based discrimination in employment, licensing, housing, and civic engagement. Additionally, CSS's Next Door project helps more than 650 New Yorkers each year obtain, review, understand, and correct mistakes in their New York State and FBI rap sheets. CSS supports the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice taking steps to establish a simple, accessible system that can be used by both advocates and members of the public to correct criminal record errors. Because there is currently no uniform or standardized system for doing so in New York City, advocates and members of the public must navigate a labyrinth-like process that often requires 
information to be gathered from various agencies, departments, courts, and offices across the city. Um, obtaining this information can be confusing, time-consuming, logistically difficult, if not downright impossible. Sometimes information is not immediately available, but must be requested and then later retrieved in person at a particular office or court building. One DA's office goes even further and will not permit members of the public to request information in person and instead requires that information be requested by mail. Many CSS clients face difficulties when attempting to gather information about their own criminal records so that errors can be fixed. For example, and in particular in cases where official records show that an arrest took place and no post disposition um, outcome, no disposition has been posted for that arrest, individuals can be required to go to multiple court buildings or government agencies to gather information required to show how the arrest was terminated. Additionally, once an individual actually locates the relevant files, clerks or other court personnel sometimes provide inaccurate information. Further, individuals who are not provided a free copy of their certificates of disposition can be financially burdened by the $10 per document fee. The confusing and time-consuming nature of the process that New Yorkers must currently navigate operates as a barrier to getting criminal record errors fixed. This barrier impedes the ability of justice-involved New Yorkers and the communities of color that are disproportionately impacted by our city's policing to move forward after contact with the justice system. We encourage the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to engage with CSS and other legal services providers and reentry advocates who help low-income New Yorkers to overcome barriers to reentry to establish a system that makes it easier for members of the public and their advocates to correct criminal record errors. CSS also supports MOCJ coordinating efforts to ensure that relevant city agencies are responsive to requests from members of the public and advocates to correct mistakes on criminal records. CSS offers the following suggestions. First, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice should carefully consider the speed with which city agencies should be required to provide information to members of the public or advocates regarding an individual's criminal record. So that, the, so that production of that information takes place within a meaningful time frame. In doing so, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice should account for the frequently tight time frames in which individuals must provide employers with information to correct inaccuracies in criminal records and require that agencies under the office's purview provide information within time frames that would allow individuals to productively comply with those requirements. As CSS has already noted, members of the public and advocates must currently navigate a confusing and long process to gather information regarding an individual's criminal record and correct criminal record errors. The fact that getting this information and correcting errors takes such a long time seriously undermines, if not negates, the important employment protections established by the Fair Chance Act, which was passed with strong city council support and signed into law in 2015. The act requires that no inquiries about a conviction history can be made until a conditional job offer is extended to an individual. After a conditional job offer is made, questions can be asked and a background check can be run. An employer who then intends to rescind the job offer based on conviction history information must provide the applicant with a copy of any background check used and indicate which convictions or circumstances the employer considers to be problematic. The employer is then required to hold the position open for a minimum of three business days. During these three business days, the applicant is given the opportunity to correct any mistaken information the employer has received about the applicant's criminal record or to provide the employer with evidence of rehabilitation or both. An applicant will generally be seeing the background check used by the employer for the first time at this juncture, and it may well contain errors. However, because it is so difficult to get original source public record information needed to correct those errors, it is often impossible for job applicants to provide potential employers with that information within three business days. This means 
that in, order for, that in order for the measures contemplated in this bill to actually help New Yorkers who are trying to utilize the important protections provided by the Fair Chance Act, city agencies must be required to provide information to members of the public and their advocates very quickly. Otherwise, for individuals with errors in their background checks, the Fair Chance Act may fail of its purpose. The second suggestion that CSS offers re is regarding voided arrests and declined prosecution. CSS suggests that the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice require the NYPD and DA offices in the five boroughs to respond to requests for information by immediately providing an on-the-spot letter stating that the arrest has been voided or prosecution has been declined as appropriate. This letter could then be presented to potential employers to clarify the status of the arrest at issue or used to substantiate and correct a criminal record error or both. CSS's third suggestion is that it would be helpful for the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to coordinate efforts across the five boroughs to ensure local courts uniform processing of applications for certificates of relief from disabilities. Currently, courts in each borough use a different procedure. For individuals seeking certificates from more than one court and their advocates, the variety of procedures makes for confusion and wasted effort. Finally, CSS also notes that it supports the bill's directive that the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice take all measures necessary to ensure that the public is aware of the system that the office will establish for correcting criminal record errors. In order to ensure that the programs contemplated in this bill are effective, it will be important for members of the public to easily obtain information about their own criminal record, understand that information, understand that they have the ability to correct criminal record errors, and understand the rights and protections that are available to them under New York City law. In support of this goal, CSS offers the following suggestions. Number one, we encourage the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to engage with CSS and other legal services providers and reentry advocates to provide public education regarding criminal records and legal services regarding criminal record errors. Number two, CSS suggests that the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice take all steps necessary to make the public aware of sealing opportunities currently available in New York. Currently, or including under Criminal Procedure Law 160.59, which went into effect earlier this month, as well as the underutilized Drug Law Reform Act sealing pursuant to Criminal Procedure Law 160.58. And as a final suggestion regarding Bill 1636, CSS suggests that the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice engage with CSS and other legal services providers and reentry advocates to provide public education regarding sealing opportunities and consider allocating funds to these providers and advocates so they may assist as many New Yorkers as need their services. So now I'd like to offer CSS's testimony regarding Bill 6381 on warrants. Um, the previously considered bill T2017-6381 would amend the administrative code of the City of New York regarding to address outstanding criminal warrants. CSS supports the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice establishing a means for members of the public to rectify inaccurate warrants. CSS also supports the bill's directive that the office ensure that records of outstanding warrants maintained by the NYPD are consistent with records maintained by the Office of Court Administration. Right now, it is very difficult for members of the public and advocates to ascertain whether an individual has any open warrants or whether a known warrant is active because warrant information is contained in various databases maintained by the NYPD and OCA, and these databases are often inconsistent. Ensuring that the NYPD warrant databases are consistent with OCA databases will help eliminate uncertainty and confusion. Inconsistent databases also have other directly harmful effects. The unfortunate truth is that members of the public often do not learn that they have a warrant until it creates an immediate problem. For example, an individual may be stopped by the police either due to the alleged open warrant or due to new potential criminal conduct. The alleged open warrant can, can be and is frequently used as a reason to involuntarily return the individual to court to answer the warrant 
or to detain an individual and process their arrest through central booking rather than issuing a summons or a desk appearance ticket. Alleged open warrants are also often cited by DAs at arraignment when making recommendations that bail be set. An individual with warrants in their past, whether open or otherwise, is cited as a flight risk, someone who should be detained pending prosecution. Alternatively, an individual may not learn about the existence of a warrant until it comes up on a background check run by an employer, which then could create an almost certain barrier to employment unless that issue is immediately rectified. In some circumstances, NYPD databases apparently list warrants as open that were previously quashed by the courts, and the reverse is also true. CSS works with hundreds of individuals each year to obtain, review, and correct mistakes in their official criminal record rap sheets. When we see entries for warrants, we check with courts to determine whether or not they are active, and in many cases, they are not. In some cases, they are still listed as active, but should not be. Inaccurate records from both the courts and NYPD are to blame. It is harrowing and difficult for an individual who is not working with CSS or another legal services provider to determine the status of warrants on their own or to clear improper records. In some cases, clients report that before they engaged our services, they had difficulty explaining to either the NYPD or the courts as appropriate that a warrant had previously been quashed and the result was that they were then picked up for no reason, detained, and processed through central booking when, when they should have instead been issued a summons or a desk appearance ticket, or they had bail set because improper entries were used to paint them as a flight risk. New York City needs to simplify the process that members of the public and advocates use to determine whether an individual has any open warrants and to rectify inaccurate warrants. CSS suggests that the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice engage with CSS and other legal services providers to establish a means for rectifying inaccurate warrants and makes, that makes sense for low-income and vulnerable New Yorkers. CSS also supports the bill's directive that the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice take all steps necessary to facilitate reducing the number of outstanding warrants. Regarding the organization and implementation of events for the purpose of vacating criminal warrants, CSS offers the following suggestion to the Council and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. To the greatest extent possible, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice should take all steps necessarily, necessary to administratively vacate outstanding summons warrants that are at least five years old and host warrant vacating events to clear more recent entries. CSS lauds the four district attorneys who previously vacated 10-year-old and more summons warrants and suggests that this effort be, ex be extended to warrants that are five years old and more. Doing so would efficiently clear the books of stale warrants without the need for individual appearance, which some people find difficult to achieve due to childcare, work, or other obligations, or perhaps due to an unfounded fear of immigration or other consequences. That means that court officer, public defender, and DA involvement could thus be reserved for events hosted for clearing warrants that are less than five years old. And as a final note, CSS supports the bill's directive that the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice will prepare annual reports compiling data on outstanding warrants in New York City and submit those reports to the Mayor and the Council and post reports on the office's website. The annual reports prepared by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice will be useful because they will illustrate law enforcement trends related to warrants and will indicate which parts of the city have an inordinate need for warrant-related warrant -related relief. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi. I'm Judy Whiting, with the, the, also with Community Service Society. I'm going to switch okay. this up a little bit. I'm not going to talk about those two bills. Okay. Instead, okay. I'm going to talk about um, Intro 1664, that's okay. the subject of the written testimony that's been handed up. And then briefly, I'm going to touch on Intro 1712. Okay. So CSS strongly supports Intro 1664. This bill in the hearing could not come at a better time. The issues this bill covers are timely and important for, and affect all of us as New Yorkers. New York City Transit Authority is the largest subway system in the world and as obvious to anyone who rides it, um, the busiest in the Western Hemisphere, and New York City itself covers more than 300 miles. 
Each weekday, about six million people ride the subway, each weekday, to work, to medical appointments, to go to school, to pick up kids from daycare. But one in four New Yorkers report that they are struggling to afford the fare. This is an issue demonstrated by our polling data and is highlighted by the work of the Swipe It Forward campaign. To address the problem, CSS and the Riders Alliance introduced the Fair Fares campaign to get half-price metro cards for low-income New Yorkers. We have strong city council support and editorial support and public support for the campaign, and we continue to wage the fight. As we drew attention in the campaign to the underlying unaffordability crisis, many New Yorkers and public defenders pointed to even more serious consequences. Unaffordable fares, combined with aggressive fare-beating enforcement, a hallmark of broken windows policing, was annually dragging more than 26,000 people, most of whom were poor and most of whom were black and Latino, through the criminal justice system. As already highlighted, even a simple arrest, no matter whether it results in prosecution or not, can have lifelong consequences, including lost work, the possibility of a criminal record that limits access to jobs, housing, and higher education, and could put an immigrant at risk of deportation. These concerns prompted Community Service Society, with Brooklyn fare evasion arrest data provided to us by the Legal Aid Society and Brooklyn Defender Services, to shed light on how fare evasion policing was affecting our communities. The Brooklyn data painted a stark picture of inequality, as graphically shown in our report, and I've handed up a couple of copies, um, the crime of being short 275. This report was issued today, and uh, we thank you. I've handed it up. I've got more copies if anyone wants it. It's also available for free download on our website. Um, our troubling findings underlie the need to have pol publicly available data on fare evasion arrests and civil summonses gathered and published on a timely, regular basis. Um, Bill Intro 66 1664 would do just that. Having access to the data that the bill requires to be provided and published would allow us and others to see whether the patterns we observe in Brooklyn are playing out across the city. It would also allow us and others to assess the impact of district attorneys' announced changes in prosecution of fare evasion arrests. By prosecuting fare evasion arrests as it does now, New York City is essentially criminalizing poverty with racially discriminatory effects. We should instead work to make public transit affordable for all, including those living in poverty. CSS likewise supports Intro 1712, introduced by Councilmember Lankman, to require collection and publication of detailed information about arrests and their disposition in New York City. CSS's legal department, as previously mentioned, exclusively represents individuals' conviction histories in reentry matters, including employment, licensing, housing cases. And our next door project helps New Yorkers obtain correct mistakes in and understand their criminal record rap sheets. Our clients' experiences shape our policy and legislative advocacy in this area, including our work as legal advocate on the New York City Fair Chance Act, and our current work in mobilizing a statewide campaign for legislation that would expunge stale criminal records. In our policy and legal work, we would be immensely helped by detailed data that qualifies and quantifies the types and dispositions of arrests. The bill would go a very long way towards making criminal enforcement trends observable and known. Fortified by the data the bill requires to be collected and published, we would thus be able to learn how each actor in the criminal enforcement system, from police to prosecutors to courts, approaches their mission, and whether stated policies translated into concrete changes. I have two issues to note about Bill 1712. I do not believe that the bill currently includes in its definition of, um, uh, uh, in, in its intro definition, and doesn't currently capture arrests that are voided by the NYPD. I would like to ask that the bill be amended to include that information as data that's captured under the bill. And then lastly, um, I think the, the, on the very last page, in the last paragraph or so, it refers to um, individuals with conviction histories as inmates. I would ask that that language be changed. So to, to clarify, voided arrest should be included in the definition of disposition at the beginning of the bill. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much uh, for this incredible panel. Thank you for your testimony, for your suggestions on how we can enhance the legislation, but generally your support and your work. Um, I, I won't trouble you with questions because your testimonies were very detailed and gave a lot of information for the council to review. Um, and I do have two panels after you. So I want to thank you again for your time and looking forward to our work together. Thank you thank once you. again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next panel we are calling to testify is Wesley Keynes from the Bronx Defenders, Kate Rubin from Youth Represent, Christine Bella and Marlene Bodden from Legal Aid Society, and Jared Chaussau from Brooklyn Defender Services. So Wesley, you're here. Jared is here. Do you have Christine and Marlene? Yes. Oh, Mar Marlene. Okay. And Kate. Okay. Got it. I do not. Of course. Okay. Okay, thank you all. Um, we can begin here with Kate. Um, those of you that have provided testimony, we appreciate it. Um, the testimony is here for the record, so if you don't want to, you don't have to read the entire testimony. You can always highlight some of the points if you choose, uh, just as an option. Don't feel obligated. That was, that was already <laughs> my plan. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> Welcome. So yeah, I'm going to try to keep it brief because um, there's been a lot of great testimony already. I'm Kate Rubin, Director of Policy at Youth Represent. We provide holistic legal representation to youth 24 and under who've been uh, in the criminal justice system and thank you for the chance to testify. Um, I, I really echo what a lot of my colleagues uh, from the reentry legal services world say. So uh, on intro 1636, so just to echo them, we support the bill. We think there's an important role for MACJ to play, facilitating uh, you know, rap sheet error correction, um, Practically speaking, a lot of the errors that are both most difficult to fix and also have the most severe consequences for our young people originate from NYPD, what we call hanging arrests and voided arrests. So we respectfully urge the council to go further than uh, what the current bill uh, language includes and to specifically direct NYPD to address hanging arrests and voided arrests and to um, basically improve their systems for um, creating and do documentation and transmitting that documentation to people who need it. I go into a little bit more detail about, about those specifics um, in the written testimony. Um, but simply put, prospective in employers and landlords won't wait weeks for a person to track down a lieutenant at NYPD who is willing to fax over the right paperwork to prove that what looks like an open robbery is actually a sealed uh, case and dismissed case. Um, we also echo some of the uh, amendments to 1636 that others have suggested, um, including creating a streamlined process for ap applying to certificates of relief from disabilities, adding to the public education component, um, raising awareness about sealing opportunities. And also want to note, um, as others have, that legal services providers are still going to be needed to do this work. So to keep that in mind um, as sort of budget allocations are made. Um, we also support intro 1664 and 1712 and intro 1569. I just, for 1664, the Landsman Bill on Transit Arrests, I know there was some conversation between the councilman um, and the NYPD about, um, about the bill uh, and the uh, particularly subsections D and E, which would make public specific information about DATs and the reasoning for making a full arrest in lieu of summons for fare evasion. Um, that information in the absence of legislation is never publicly available and we really think it's essential to oversight of the transit recidivist policy that was outlined by the NYPD today. 
um, and to understanding how officers use the tremendous discretion that they have to enforce fair evasion with either criminal or civil penalties. I think it's worth uh, noting that, you know, the committee is considering a bill today about uh, errors in criminal records and errors in these databases. Uh, because of those errors, I think people are frequently marked as transit recidivists when they're not, and we need that information. Um, I would just close on that point by saying that the NYPD has incredibly sophisticated systems for collecting data and using it for police practices. I, as it's my understanding that they're a worldwide leader in that area um, and that I have to believe that they have the capacity to reasonably easily comply with the mandates um, that are in 1664. So thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Gibson. My name is Jared Chauso. Uh, I'm the Advocacy Specialist at Brooklyn Defender Services. I want to thank you for inviting us to testify today. Um, so in short, because I also okay. will summarize, uh, BDS supports Intro 1636 relating to rap sheet errors, Intro 1664 relating uh, to reporting and fair evasion arrests and civil summonses, Intro 1712 relating to the reporting of criminal case dispositions, uh, intro, or excuse me, T2017-6381 relating to criminal warrant errors uh, and resolution 1660, uh, that's yours, Chair Gibson, relating to gravity knife reform. Um, we also, in addition, offer um, rec some certain recommendations to strengthen these bills. I won't go into all of them today. They are in our written testimony. Um, we do take no, no position on the remaining items, um, but we do offer some comments on the resolution re uh, regarding uh, concealed carry reciprocity in the written testimony. So briefly, in 2015, uh, BDS's re-entry unit launched a, a rap sheet cleanup project. And when I say our re-entry unit, I should say it was Mr. Wesley Keynes, who's to my right when he was at Brooklyn Defender Services, who created that project, uh, which unearthed um, what uh, you know, we now recognize was decades of neglect of rap sheet accuracy uh, that uh, was well known to certain actors in the criminal legal system. So one significant factor in these, in these errors that we need to talk about, we need to recognize today, is the immense size and scope um, of our criminal legal system and of the record keeping required. So according to a Legal Action Center report that you'll hear more about later, um, there's something like 7 million people across the state with rap sheets. Um, quite a few have, have errors, estimated around 30%. Uh, and until very recently, there were, as we heard earlier, 1.5 million open warrants in this city with about half of those remaining. Uh, so simply as a clerical system, uh, this is a massive undertaking, especially given the high stakes of, of criminal records. We're talking about lifelong job and housing discrimination, deportation, false arrest, imprisonment, and, and many other consequences. Uh, so the agencies responsible for these records have an enormous burden to bear uh, and uh, frankly have grossly inadequate systems and no real-time quality control measures in place. Um, and, that's, and that's disappointing. Um, so again, we, uh, we support this bill. Um, I would echo the comments of my colleague, Ms. Rubin, uh, regarding the additional mandate on NYPD. Um, there are certain elements of these, of, uh, these errors that stem from the NYPD, and, and we know that they are best positioned to be able to fix them. Um, a couple specific recommendations. That I think are, are important. Every person in, in, in the city or in, across the state should have free and easy access to their own criminal records uh, without having to receive any indigence waiver or any additional paperwork so they can check for errors and advocate for themselves as needed. Um, a city agency that has these records, other than law enforcement, should be able to provide them free of, free of charge, and that could circumvent the state's revenue generating scheme. Uh, the NYPD should be required to include a sunset clause with any fingerprints it sends to DCJS to prevent hanging and voided arrests from appearing on rap sheets uh, long term. If the arrest does not lead to a court case within a given time period, that should be purged. Um, and uh, I also agree with, with, with Ms. Rubin, as, as Mock J publicizes its, its role in correcting rap sheets according to this legislation, it should also publicize sealing opportunities. Brooklyn Defender Services is currently promoting its own uh, assistance in sealing at our community office in, in East New York. So very briefly about gravity knives, um, I, in our testimony we provide several horrifying stories of BDS clients impacted by our state's unjust gravity knife law. 
And I just want to thank Councilmember Gibson for pushing a resolution supportive reform uh, and, and to note that bill is awaiting action from Governor Cuomo as we speak. And one story in particular that struck me is uh, at a rally earlier this afternoon, our supervising immigration attorney shared the story of a man who, who had lawful status, he was not undocumented, um, but ha was detained for about nine months in ICE jail after his criminal case uh, stemming from a gravity knife arrest was resolved. And ultimately, we were able to uh, get him freed on bond after a lot of litigating over what constitutes an illegal weapon in New York State. Um, but others might not be so lucky, and ultimately this man was spent nine months in jail, you know, uncertain, with an uncertain future, and unable to care for his family because of a utility knife that he used on the warehouse job. So I, I really appreciate this resolution, and I hope the governor is listening and does the right thing. And lastly, on the um, concealed carrier reciprocity bill, you know, BDS takes no formal position on this, resolu on this resolution. Um, but as I said earlier, we do offer some comments and context in our written testimony that uh, warrant review. Um, and in particular, we attach uh, to our testimony a, an article that appeared in Village Voice last year um, regarding some of the uh, police practices that are involved in, in, in gun regulations in New York City. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairperson Gibson. Um, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Wesley Keynes, and I am the Reentry and Community Outreach Coordinator for the Bronx Defenders. Um, part of the civil action practice, we each year handle tens of thousands of New Yorkers in both criminal matters and the consequences deriving from those criminal justice involvements. Um, I too will make my comments abbreviated. Um, I would like to say that the Bronx Defenders are in support of Resolution 1664, 1660, 1569, 6381, but I would like to have a few comments, a few moments to have some comments regarding Intro 1636 regarding the streamlining, um, empowering Mob J to streamline the system of criminal record correction that is both public and easily accessible to individuals and their advocates. We find this legislation to be timely. We also believe that it's a great first start, but the goals of this legislation, we feel, will not be served unless there's more specific language placed within this legislation. Um, for this reason, the Bronx Defenders recommends that each New York City resident who requests, upon request, receive a free criminal record each year in the same way that credit reporting agencies are required to do. We find it incredible that government agencies that maintain criminal records that have such profound impact on the lives of New Yorkers don't have a mandate that the legislature mandates that credit reporting agencies should fulfill, which is providing the public access to the records maintained so that the public could realize whether or not there are errors and with direction as to how to correct those errors. Um, had this policy been in place, the example of one particular former client of mine possibly could have been avoided. This particular client as a teenager worked at a preschool and as a teenager, she was not required to have a background check. However, in her late teens, she was detained by NYPD with a male colleague, a male companion, and after several hours at the precinct, her arrest was voided and she was advised to watch her company. Unbeknownst to her, however, a criminal record had been established for her in Albany through DCJS and NYPD's relationship about processing fingerprints. In her early 20s, Jessica again tried to work at this same preschool, and because she was an adult, a background check was required. Upon the background check's return, it was revealed that she had an erroneous, non-existent open case. Her employer, because of the prior relationship, allowed her four weeks with which to get documentation to prove that. Uh, 
and I must advise and I must say that four weeks is highly unusual. And the only reason why she received four weeks was because of that prior relationship. For two weeks, my former client, Jessica, went from the courthouse to the precinct to one police plaza to no avail to get documentation indicating that she did not have an open case. Ultimately, Jessica was referred to me by a colleague and I was able to, working with the local district attorney, get a letter indicating that this was in fact avoided arrest. Ultimately, Jessica was able to regain employment at this child care provider, but it shouldn't take for someone like me in order for a resident of New York City to access their records or to prove errors in their criminal records. I think at the bare minimum, having a yearly background check of oneself for free is at the minimum that government can do to ensure that the detrimental impact of justice involvement doesn't follow people in their move forward in life. Um, the Brooklyn, Def the Bronx Defenders, sorry. <laughs> The Bronx Defenders um, also have five recommendations that we feel in addition to free yearly background check criminal records for residents. We believe that NYPD should direct DCJS to purge any arrest information after 30 days if no further information is provided by OCA indicating that a prosecution has commenced. And Kate mentioned and Jared mentioned as well that one of the big issues, and NYPD is a, is a big violator of this, um, one of the big issues is getting documentation to prove error. And this council wisely two years ago passed the Fair Chance Act. And I think as we reflect now on stop and frisk and the impact of it on certain communities, I think moving forward that we should look to dismantle the impact of stop and frisk. And this is another opportunity to do that. Government agencies, especially the ones under the purview of New York City, NYPD, uh, Department of Corrections, should be mandated to provide documentation on errors to residents in this city within three days. It will afford people an opportunity to gain employment and to move on with their lives after justice involvement. And, you know, in the case of Jessica, she did not have a criminal record. That's really important to understand that someone who did not, a young person who did not have a criminal record was made to run around this city trying to get proof that she did not have said record. Second, we ask that this legislation be amended to mandate that the Department of Correction notify DCJS whenever someone in its custody is not produced for court appearance. If the person's failure to appear leads to issuance and then a vacatur of a bench warrant. This also is important for clients. It makes, earlier in testimony, um, the chair mentioned that criminal records reflects the character of individuals. And I think that if we're gonna hold up criminal records as the basis for gauging someone's character, then it's incumbent upon us to make sure that those records are properly reflected and that they are correct. And I think that this second mandate would do that. We also ask that the legislation be amended so that NYPD informs OCA whenever it voids an arrest. This because the first place that people usually turn when they're told that they have an open case is to the courts. And clerks are unaware if NYPD have voided an arrest. They are unaware if the DAs have declined to prosecute. And this can become time consuming for them. Um, previous testimony spoke about the requirement to take time off from work if they're already working. And just not having time and money to really run around to different government agencies. The fourth mandate is that NYPD and DOC respond to the request, which I've mentioned, 
um, within three days to be in alignment with the Fair Chance Act. And we also ask that Mark J encourage the city's district attorneys to do likewise. Also, we ask that the legislation recommends the encouragement of district attorneys to share decline to prosecute information with, DC, with OCA as well. Um, part of the challenge that I find in my day-to-day -day work is that DCJS is fully aware of the errors in their database, but they're of the position that they are not empowered to make corrections unless those agencies which provided the information mandate that they do so. And I think the city agencies that provide the information to DCJS should be mandated to have a fluid transfer of information to make sure that records are accurately kept. Um, once again, I would like to thank the chair and this committee for allowing me to represent the Bronx Defenders in stating our position on intro 1636. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, my name is Marlon Bodden, and I'm an attorney in the Special Litigation Unit of the Legal Aid Society's Criminal okay. Defense Practice. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, Robert Newman, who um, helped to prepare the testimony that we submitted. Uh, and also, um, after I speak, our colleague in the Juvenile Rights Practice, Christine Bella, will speak about this, uh, the question of erroneous criminal records and uh, juveniles. So earlier, Mock J completely washed its, its hands of the problem of erroneous criminal records. Uh, they blamed it on DCJS, and they, you know, they just had nothing to say about the mayor and, and the city's responsibility to order NYPD and DOC to correct errors in criminal records and warrants, and to correct them in a prompt manner, as others have described. Countless uh, current, future, and former criminal defendants, detainees, and inmates in New York City would be affected if Mach J exercised this authority over these agencies and ordered them to update all erroneous criminal records promptly and to include expired criminal warrants before people are released from custody or um, even after they've been released from custody, and as everyone else described, they're trying to find a job or trying to find housing, etc. At present, there is no oversight by the city over NYPD and DOC on how they handle criminal records. And we know they generate millions of criminal records all the time. Um, so. I, I think that the most important part here is to get, is for the city council to work with uh, Mach J, and we also are interested in working with Mach J, to get them to provide oversight of NYPD and DOC and how they generate records. Um, I have a few example of the, um, examples of the impact of erroneous warrants and criminal records. And one of them um, was a pretty well-known case that was in the New York Times uh, a few years ago, Nicholas Bowen. And I use this example because it really uh, is quite similar to what our clients go through every day, all the time. Uh, Mr. Bowen was arrested, NYPD arrested Mr. Bowen four times. I know I'm saying it like a kindergartner saying four, but four times because it just uh, really um, upsets me here on a vacated dismissed warrant that was erroneously issued in 2008. And I describe in the written testimony every single arrest and how he, the court gave him a letter to say this warrant has been dismissed. He showed it to NYPD and they refused to even look at it. Now Mr. Bowen's case is an extreme example of a problem encountered frequently by our clients. Um, at least a, a dozen times a year on average, the special litigation unit is advised that a client appeared in court after being held overnight in police detention only because NYPD claimed that our client was the subject of a warrant, when in fact either the warrant had been vacated or the warrant was for somebody else entirely. 
Legal aid attorneys often are able to secure a letter from, criminal court, from a criminal court judge, as Mr. Bowen did, stating that the client is not the subject of a warrant. But even if the client remembers to always carry this letter um, at all times, the police are prone to ignore it. Now, N NYPD's retention of a warrant in its files is active after it has been vacated by a court is inexcusable negligence. Our colleagues have suggested practical ways to address this issue involving better coordination between the NYPD and the courts, and we urge the council and the mayor's office to end this harmful practice. Now, there's also another um, awful problem regarding warrants called the wrong man warrant, particularly when identity theft is involved and when the underlying warrant was issued on a summons and no photograph of the right defendant is contained in NYPD files. Um, but there are approaches that, can, that could really help regarding technology. If the city council work together with Mock J and Mock J work together with uh, defenders and other organizations. It is a gross injustice to hold a person in custody on somebody else's warrant. Now, I, I also have another, a few other examples um, involving the Department of Correction. Uh, one of our clients, CJ was jailed for a month at Rikers, losing wages that time, of course, uh, because the DOC inmate lookup service listed an expired warrant. The bailed bondsman refused to accept his family's um, offer to put up the money to post bail the day after he was arrested. Another client, ML, was denied eligibility for drug, rehabilita uh, drug rehabilitation program because the DOC inmate lookup service listed an expired parole warrant. And the Legal Aid Society, the Special Litigation Unit, we have contacted DOC's general counsel very, numerous times. And we have asked them to correct the information on the DOC inmate lookup uh, website and they have refused to do so. Instead, what they did was they said, well, we'll put up a disclaimer on the website. They do have this little disclaimer that it is in tiny font, and bail bondsmen, though, don't bother to look at it. So they'll assume that if there's a warrant on the website, that it's a, an active warrant when it actually isn't. We work closely with um, bail, with organizations that post bail for our clients, like the Bronx Freedom Fund, and they also have had problems posting bail on our clients' behalf because of the DOC inmate lookup service listing expired parole warrants. Um, I will now defer to um, my colleague in the juvenile rights practice, but um, I have, we have, Numerous examples in the, in the testimony that we submitted of how our clients actually face this problem. Thank you, Marlon. Good afternoon. So I'm, I'm speaking to you from the juvenile rights practice, and we represent youth charged as juvenile delinquents in the New York City family courts. So we're here today to speak specifically with regard to intro 1636 as it relates to um, the maintenance of uh, erroneous criminal records. And our um, written testimony includes line edits um, that we would ask you to take a look at so that when the bill is finalized, it will include a definition of juvenile records as distinct from criminal records. We think um, this will serve an important purpose because many youth who are ultimately prosecuted, arrested, and or prosecuted in the family courts do face collateral consequences, negative consequences as a result of erroneous criminal records being maintained by a variety of city agencies as well as the Division of Criminal Justice Services. So the family court itself does provide certain confidentiality protections, sealing protections, and in certain instances even expungement or destruction. However, these laws do not go far enough to protect the interests of those who have been prosecuted in the family court. And 
We've undertaken advocacy with much success with the myriad of agencies um, that you've heard are responsible for maintaining these records and affording confidentiality. However, problems do persist. The most egregious problems that we see occur when youth are initially charged as juvenile offenders or arrested as so-called adults, but are in fact never prosecuted or if prosecuted are prosecuted in the family court rather than the, the criminal court. So the errors we find in these instances originate from the following sources. The f one, the failure of the NYPD to properly void its arrests, as you've heard, the failure of the district attorney's office or the corporation counsel's office to notify DCJS of its decision to decline to prosecute, the failure of the courts to notify DCJS of a decision to remove a case from criminal court to family court, the failure of the family court to notify DCJS of its disposition, or DCJS failing to act on the information provided by the various agencies. We've been contacted by several people over the years seeking to have erroneous juvenile records fixed, including having those juvenile arrests removed from their DCJS rap sheets and their FBI rap sheets. These clients were not even aware, as you've heard from other panelists, that the errors existed until they were revealed during criminal background checks prepared for employment purposes. So I just want to briefly touch on two examples that I think highlight the problem um, here in New York City. I know you've heard uh, from a host of people with examples, but I, I would like for these voices to be heard as well. At the age of 23, BK, a young man uh, from Brooklyn, contacted our office as he was denied employment with the New York City Department of Education because he purportedly had an open juvenile arrest from seven years prior. In fact, he had been acquitted of these charges after trial many years earlier in the family court and hadn't given it much thought. He and his mother tried unsuccessfully for months to correct this error. He was denied employment and his record was not cleared until the Legal Aid Society became involved and contacted the Corporation Counsel's Office, the District Attorney's Office, and DCJS several times in order to resolve the matter. Recently, we assisted a young woman in her early 20s from Queens who learned about a purportedly open juvenile arrest from 10 years earlier, which had been prosecuted in family court. It appeared in error on her FBI rap sheet when she was seeking employment. Fearing that she would lose her job, she immediately went to family court where the matter had been handled some 10 years earlier. Thankfully, the clerk in family court, although he could not help her, referred her to our office, and we were able to assist her with clearing the FBI record. I will say we were able to assure her employer that the matter appeared erroneously. She did re obtain the job. However, we're still awaiting confirmation from both DCJS and the FBI that this matter has been removed from her rap sheet. So that's just to say even with the assistance, with legal assistance, um, it's t we're months into this process and we still don't have an assurance that this will not appear again. Um, so. In closing, um, we appreciate the, the Council's attention to these matters. We support Intro 1636 and Intro 6381. With the amendments that we've proposed in our written testimony, we urge you to look at the line edits we've provided because both NYPD and DOC need oversight from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to address criminal records and juvenile records and outstanding criminal warrants. Moreover, MOCJ can play a very useful role as set out in this proposed legislation to ensure that city and state agencies such as DCJS and OCA work together to see that criminal records are both accurate and transparent. We're eager to work with the council and with the mayor's office on how to implement the bill's goals and to prevent further harms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Once again, I appreciate your detailed testimony of the legislation before us, but also the work you're doing and really telling the tales of your clients. Um, very interesting, very alarming, but certainly um, continues to underscore the need for reform. So we appreciate all of you coming today and we have your testimony for the record and we certainly look forward to our continued work together. Thank you, Thank you so much for coming today. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, our next and final panel for
This afternoon's hearing is Marielle Getz from the Brady Center and Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence, Kelly Grace Price from Jails Action Coalition, and Tawaki Komafsu. If, you, if everyone is still here, please come forward. If there's anyone else who is here to testify that has not signed up to do so, please do so now. Or anyone's name who I did not call, please let us know. Thank you, ladies. Uh, who's Marielle and who's Kelly? Okay, Grace. Okay. okay. I'm Marielle. Okay, great. You can start. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is Marielle Getz. I'm counsel with the Brady Center and Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence. And we are here to testify in support of um, T2017-6705, the bill regarding warning language on firearm application permits. And I'll direct you to my detailed testimony. I'll keep it very short. Um, you can see my detailed testimony for more information about Brady and what we do as an organization to fight this horrible epidemic of gun violence in our country. Um, and I'll go straight to our support of this particular legislation, which we believe is an important and innovative and very promising way to uh, ensure that people who are considering owning guns are aware of the risks that they might pose to their households and their family members. Brady is proud to support this proposed legislation. While the U.S. Supreme Court has held that law-abiding responsible citizens have a constitutional right to a gun in the home for self-defense, the court recognized that the Second Amendment allows for reasonable regulations, which would certainly include this ordinance. It is unquestionably constitutional. Indeed, gun owners and potential gun owners have a right and a need to know the truth about guns. Warnings about the risks posed by firearms in the home are much needed, to be clear. Study after study has confirmed that bringing a gun into one's home increases one's risk of suicide, domestic violence-related fatalities, and unintentional shootings. Yet at the same time as these studies have made the risks posed by guns in the home undeniable, the gun industry has continued to market guns as enhancing safety. This marketing is misleading as it contradicts the scientific truth about the risks posed by guns. It also is dangerous as it gives gun owners a, mis, um, a misimpression about those risks and prevents them from making a truly informed decision before exposing themselves and their families to these risks. More dangerously still, Studies show that a significant number of gun owners do not safely store their guns as they should, especially when there are children in the home. When people are under a misimpression as to the risks and benefits posed by having guns in the home, it follows that they will be less likely to feel that it's important to store those guns safely to minimize those risks. This bill addresses those problems in a way that can be important and impactful. It ensures that gun owners and prospective gun owners will hear some of the truth about the risks that they and their families can be exposed to when they bring a gun into their home. We hope it is enacted and becomes law. They say the truth can set you free. It can also save lives. Thank you for inviting us to speak on this important issue and for your support of this measure. Thank you very much. We appreciate your presence here. Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Kelly Grace Price. I'm delighted to speak in front of you. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Gibson, for seeing me again. The last time that I saw you was on June 19th when we sat here and discussed NYPD technology with the NYPD during the technology hearing. And I remember specifically that you had asked VACA, VACA, Am I saying his name right? I would ask the NYPD representative that was left behind to take notes on advocacy, but she apparently, after playing the crossword on her phone all through your hearing, which I took photos of, just decided to leave before I testified. So I can't ask her if that was Vaca that you questioned. But I remember very specifically that you grilled Vaca and you asked him for detailed reports on the Domain Alert Awareness System, which is another NYPD database that holds data on all of us, not just people that have um, 
uh, had entanglements with the criminal justice system like myself, even though all of my entanglements have been dismissed and sealed, you might remember that Cy Vance arrested me and prosecuted me on 324 counts of the now defunct CPLR 240.30 that Ron Kuby uh, challenged um, in front of former Chief Judge Jonathan Lippman in 2014 and got that particular statute dismissed and sealed. But I, proud Mount Holyoke graduate, former employee of Bill Gates and JP Morgan got sent to the Rosen Singer Center over that particular statute. So <clears throat> I'll just add as a side note that I'm aware you're probably friends with Cy Vance because of your position, but I've been having a great couple of weeks watching him blow in the wind. But what I want to remind you about is that I've been complaining for years that since Cy Vance labeled me as a fabricator of domestic violence and threw me in Rikers Island, I have been marked as such in the NYPD database and every single point of contact that I have with the NYPD goes south very quickly. In August, my landlord changed the locks on my building. I live behind the synagogue on 187th Street and um, you may or may not know that there is an A roof that is being built and created ar around that particular synagogue. So. Everyone that's non-Orthodox is being chased out of the neighborhood. I called the police to make the illegal lockout complaint. As per NYPD handbook um, provision 117.11, whenever there's an illegal lockout, the NYPD are mandated to issue a summons and they can choose to make an arrest. Well, the police came, they swiped my ID, and I have no criminal background at all. I'm a Mount Holyoke graduate. I just finished working at the National Organization for Women. You may remember I was working at the Urban Justice Center's Mental Health Project. The NYPD swiped my ID. They saw that I still had all this mishigosh hanging out of the Domain Alert, Alert Awareness System, and they made me go to the psych ward on a beautiful Saturday to be evaluated. As soon as I walked into the psych ward, and I, I have no EDP, nothing in my, in my background, but for some reason, this is added in my police record. As soon as I walked into the emergency room, the doctor, knowing that I was there on some sort of EDP status, evaluated me, and I was discharged 20 minutes later. I had to walk home barefoot with my service dog, who didn't have a leash, I didn't have my shoes, I didn't have my wallet, because the NYPD had declared that I needed to immediately go to the psych ward to deal with this situation. This was an illegal lockout. The landlord should have been given a summons. But these are the kind of things that normal, everyday citizens like myself have to deal with. Not just the advocates don't just have stories, but citizens are sitting right in front of you with stories about how we're getting screwed by the, pardon my French, but no one's in here, by the bullshit that's in these databases. I currently have a piece of federal litigation in the Southern District trying to get this stuff expunged, but it's the only way to clear my record. So I would urge you, please, and I would urge the sponsor of the bill, um, um, uh, Councilman Johnson, to also consider that it's not just what's in the oath databases, and it's not just what's in the criminal justice databases, but what's in the domain alert awareness system that includes a, a behemoth of persons that don't have criminal records and don't have criminal backgrounds. Please, please, please address that because it's, it's sinking us. Basically, these databases have created a Mark McCarthyistic blacklist of people that no longer receive police services. And remember, security is the most sacrosanct promise that you can offer us as citizens. Without that, there's really just nothing left but anarchy. Thank you so much for listening to me, as always, Councilwoman Gibson, and thank you for your service to our city. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you both. I'd like to acknowledge for the record that we have received written testimony from the Campaign to Keep Guns Off Campus, Artner Center on Family Violence, Matthew Miller, Professor of Health Sciences and Epidemiology from Northeastern University, the Community Service Society, as well as New Yorkers Against Gun Violence. Thank you to all who joined us. Thank you to the staff of the Public Safety Committee for a great hearing today. More to come. Thank you to the Sergeant at Arms. This hearing of the Committee on Public Safety is hereby adjourned. <laughs>